good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's city council meeting. The meeting is called to order. I will kindly ask our city clerk to please take the roll call. Mike Bruno. Here. Eric Burkhart. Here. Don Cummings. Here. Jim Ruby. Here. Dean Silver. Here. Mike Malaja. Here. Richard Marks. Here. Ian McGowan. Here. Jim Radecki. Here. Robert Swanson. Here. We have a full house tonight, folks. Earlier this evening, uh, Alderman Radecki, Alderman Marks, and I believe, who else, got to witness uh, a conversation with PAC 238 and the Weeblos. We had a good time, didn't we? Yeah. Yes, we did. The parents were particularly impressed. Who was the kid who had to have his shirt tucked in when we were walking up here? <laughs> that was you? It's always those moms, isn't it? These gentlemen have agreed to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance this evening, so I would invite PAC 238 to please step forward and lead us in the pledge. And we'll follow your lead, gentlemen. Have you ready, guys? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Before we commence with uh, city business, ladies and gentlemen, I'm certain most of you uh, noticed that the city of Geneva, state of Illinois, and the U.S. flag are at half staff. Uh, the U.S. flag is directed to be at half staff by the President of the United States, the state flag by the governor, and the Geneva flag by uh, myself and this council. Uh, we do so uh, in honor of and in remembrance of those who were killed in Las Vegas. Uh, I kindly ask that all of us just bow our head for a moment of reflection and send our warmest thoughts to those families who have been irrevocably changed. Thank you very much. Item 3A, folks, is recognition of the Art on Fire winners and participants. And I believe we have Chairman Vitang here this evening. Hello, Mr. Chairman. How are you? I'm good. Good. Welcome. This is one of the most fun things that I get to do as chair. It's got to be it's, difficult, too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the creativity is incredible. Um, first of all, before we get into it, I want to remind everybody of the Art Affair, which is going to be held on Friday, November 10th at Geneva Golf Club from 6 to 8 p.m. It's this year's annual fundraiser for the Arts Commission and its efforts to place public art and do art events throughout the community. This year it's a salon style cocktail party with live music and painting, hors d'oeuvres, fine silent auction, and a cash bar. One of the featured pieces is a retired cello donated by Evan Lowry of Stringworks, and it's been painted by Lorraine Oxner. I've seen the piece and it is fabulous. It shows all famous celloists throughout the history going back to Mozart um, that are painted on it. Um, very lifelike. Um, it's something any music lover would covet in their home. So uh, if you're able to, uh, do um, go on our website and get a ticket and come enjoy the event. It's open to the public. Um, this event is open to all the, the um, Art on Fire um, hydrant painting contest. It's open to all residents of the city. There's no age restrictions. You pick a hydrant and submit your design by the deadline. The city will let you know if it meets the requirements. The main requirement is that you don't paint it black or camouflage so the fire department can't find it when they need to. Um, with over 1,500 hydrants in town, the contest can go on for a few more years. We'd love to see them all painted. This is the fifth year for Art on Fire, and we now have over 100 hydrants painted. While many are in the center of town, you can find them throughout Geneva. There's a map with locations available on the city's website. It shows the picture, the location, and then you can go see what it looks like in person.
This is one of the first entries, Bryant on Fire. Of course, you can catch the theme of a lot of the ones for this year with this first uh, entry. And then we have um, Mike Wazowski and a creative there. We have the flower garden. Of course, Cubs win in 2016. Are there any Sox fans anywhere in the neighborhood that might, do we see the hydrants go missing or anything? Or any Sox fans in the audience? One guy, look at the. <laughs> I'm, I'm not aware of a oh, Sox yeah. hydrant that I can recall in town yeah. either. <laughs> Then we have Cubs Love, or Cub Love. Ninjago. Ninjago, thank you. You can tell I don't have any children at home. <laughs> I, I, no clue, what is Ninjago? It's a little <laughs> Sounds like a White House press briefing for God's sake. So like, yeah, who wants to come up here and... I got nothing out of that. Right there. Um, come on up to the microphone there, big guy. This is Mr. Ellis, I believe, correct? Yeah. Ninjago is basically Lego ninjas who have to stop a random bad guy who's black. Well bit. <laughs> yeah, and they made a movie. I give up. I give up. It's never easy to work with children, Tim. <laughs> well, after the hydrants are painted, we um, look at all of them and we vote on our favorites. Uh, the voters consist of the Geneva Cultural Arts Commission members. There's nine people on that board. And the Public Art Advisory Committee, which is a group of citizens that represent various groups throughout the community. And of course, Chris Ranney, an intern in the Economic Development Department. And he actually did all the work. <laughs> I get up here and get to talk about it, but he took the pictures, put it on the city's website, um, got all, collected all the information, made sure the applications were correct. Chris, where are you? Right here. Yay. It, it really wouldn't happen without the interns every year. So the, the three hydrants with the most votes receive Geneva gift certificates. And tonight we have some of the vote getters here. After I introduce each one, I'd like them to come up to the podium, tell us a bit about their piece, their inspiration, and then there'll be a moment for photos as the mayor presents you your gift certificate. I think the next one is third place. And nobody knows who won but a few of us. Ah, okay. Third place winner is A Day on the Fox by Ann Kate Douglas, and it's located on the northeast corner of State and River. I know she's here. Ann? Excellent. Good evening, Miss Douglas. How are you? Good. How are you? Well, and what grade are you in? I'm in sixth grade. Sixth grade. And which school do you attend? I go to Geneva Middle School North. Northy. Mr. Bidlack School. How's he treating you? Well? Yep. Yeah, life's good. Sixth grade, middle school is everything you thought it'd be? Yeah, mostly. Your, your inspiration for this? Um, so when we were walking down the Fox River Trail, my mom took some pictures of the um, logo of it, and I decided that I would paint that by the F Fox River, by the bridge. And so the fox is on the other side of it, and then ah. its tail comes around, and then there's the... Um, Fox River Trail, um, right on the front of it. Now, were you painting this during the real hot temperatures? Yep. Was it, that had been brutal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? Did the folks at Buttermilk come by and give you free food or anything? No. <laughs> what? How long did it take you? Um, I don't know, like a couple days, maybe. Really? Four or five? Okay, I don't know. And do you receive credit for this at school? No. What? What the what? That's Ninjago, man. It's like, <laughs> well, we've got some 
these are, Tim, this is, Mr. Chairman, these are, this is a heady prize. Dinner for two at the mill race. <laughs> <laughs> Can I share with uh, Ms. Douglas what, how much is in there or not? Sure. Guess what? It's $50 worth of gift certificates. And something to all the stores in Geneva. Mm -hmm. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Wow. Well done. Oh, you want, you got a face there. You're adoring fans here. This is like. <laughs> There's $50 worth of gift certificates from Ms. Douglas. Congratulations. Thank you. And then in second place, we have a hydrant located at 558 Westfield Course named Cubby Bear, and it was painted by Andrew and Gigi Kimball. I don't believe they're here this evening, so uh, we'll see that they get their certificate uh, a little later. We all know the Kimballs. Extraordinary. You want me to have this to you, Mr. Chairman? Sure. You can take care of it. <laughs> I like to delegate. <laughs> And then, I know they know what place they got, but we'll have to see now. In first place, located at North Lincoln in Union, we have Doodle. And it was painted by Natalia Bork and Tatiana Hamilton. And I know Natalia is here. What grade are you in, may I I'm in eighth grade. Geneva Middle School North. North, yeah. So, this is all done freehand. Pretty much, yeah. So, you uh, clearly are an artist, anyway, correct? I draw every day. You draw every day. Mm -hmm. And why this particular design? Um, it's mostly after our dog, Mika. She's a golden doodle. Really? Yeah. So, you're going to share this with Mika? I'll try to. <laughs> <laughs> Tatiana couldn't make it this evening? No, she's working on the Scarecrow Festival project. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. wow. How hard was it? I'm, it took a while. Did I mean, it I'm. Like several days? A few weeks. Really? Yeah. Is that your yard? Um, no, it's a block over in our. So the neighbors didn't care? No, they didn't really come out at all, so. <laughs> well, you scared it with a darn dog, for God's sake. First place, Mr. Chairman, I'm not certain how many, what the value is here. $150 worth of Geneva gift certificates. That's impressive, man. Make that $140. <laughs> Congratulations, we're Thank very you. proud of you. Thank you. Who's this, your dad over here? Um, yeah, my dad. Yeah, weird, guys, huh? Can I get a picture? Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome, man. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. I almost forgot. I just want to mention that for each of these hydrants, the painter buys their own paint and supplies. They come up with their own design and do all the work. And this is such a great example of how much the community spirit is alive in Geneva. And we thank each of them for making Geneva a brighter, better place and a more fun place to live in. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, very much. Just a gentle and friendly reminder to our Scouts, if you gentlemen need to sneak out, by all means, feel free to do so at any time, okay? Item four, ladies and gentlemen, amendments to the agenda. Are there any amendments this evening by any member of the council? Item five is the omnibus agenda. All items marked with an asterisk are considered to be routine and can be considered and acted upon with one motion. Is there such a motion? Motion by Marks. Second. Seconded by McGowan. Questions or comments? Seeing none, hearing none, 
All in favor of item five, we'll take a roll call. <laughs> Got it. Sorry about that, Mr. Clerk. <clears throat> Mike Bruno. Aye. Tara Burkhardt. Aye. Don Cummings. Aye. Thank you, Ruby. Aye. Dean Kilberg. Aye. Craig Malagra. Aye. Richard Marks. Aye. Dean McGowan. Aye. Kim Radecki. Aye. Robert Swanson. Aye. Item five passes with ten affirmative votes, no nay votes. We skip down two. Item number 9A, which is to recommend acceptance of the fiscal year 2017 comprehensive annual financial report. So moved. Motion by Marks. Seconded by Swanson. We do have our finance manager, Ms. Cruz, with us this evening. If there are any questions or comments. Ms. Cruz, do you want a brief presentation or you just, you got it. I got it. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to beat art. Yeah, this is a tough backdrop, isn't it? Is yeah, exactly. Mine's pretty much black and white, literally. So, um, good evening. Anthony Servini from Sickage is here to present the fiscal year 17 audit. But before he begins, I have some opening remarks about the audit. This year was another year of changes uh, with a new accounting supervisor. She was able to step up and assist with the work papers, which allowed the city to complete the audit ahead of time compared to last year's time frame. Thank you, Jennifer, for all your hard work. This year is the last year of our contract with Sickich. The city's practice is to complete an RFP process for, audit for auditors in step with the mayoral election. An RFP will be issued in the future months and be brought back to this council at a future date. Since the budget season is around the corner, here's a brief update of the three major funds, fund positions at the end of the fiscal year. As a reminder, the city's policy is to strive and maintain a 25% fund balance for the general fund and a 25% cash balance for the electric and the wastewater funds. The general fund ended up much, much better than projected during when we created the fiscal year 18 budget. Like last year, savings was primary due to a mild, primarily due to a mild winter, which allowed for lower costs of snow plowing and salt purchases coupled with an increase in local use tax, which we kind of call the Amazon tax. Uh, the general fund unassigned fund balance is at 4.8 million, while the total fund balance is at 5 million. As a percentage of expenditures, unassigned fund balance is at 30.8 percent, and total fund balance is at 32.6 percent. The electrical fund is at 27.6 percent of the cash balances, while the water wastewater fund is at 26.9. At the end of the fiscal year 2017, all our funds, all our three major funds that are listed in the policy are in compliance. For more high level interpretation of the audited financials for your reading pleasure, the management discussion analysis begins on MDNA number one, which is on your packets in front of you and in the board packet itself. Uh, also, thank you to the hard work of the finance division and the HR divisions for supporting uh, us through the audit process and the support of the city administrator throughout the fiscal year. Now I will turn, out, turn over to Anthony Snervini to discuss the audit results. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Good evening, Mr. Snervini. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. On behalf of SICK, I'd like to thank Mayor, members of the Council, for the opportunity to present the results of our audit of the city as of and for your fiscal year ended April 30th, 2017. Before I get into the reports for this evening, just to give you a high-level overview of our audit process. Our audit process actually begins back in February with our audit planning meeting. As part of that planning meeting, we discuss with the finance staff any major changes from an internal control standpoint, an operational standpoint, any new pronouncements that may have been issued by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board that would impact the city's financial statements. And most importantly, we go through and set our audit schedule for the remainder of the process. The next phase in our audit process is our preliminary field work that occurred in May of 2017 this year. We spend two days on site at the city, go through and do our internal control walkthroughs, interviews of, with staff, make any changes necessary to the comprehensive annual financial report as well as any of the other documents. And then the final step in our process is the final field work which occurred in July of this year. Our final field work is where we spend the most time on site here at the city. Uh, we go through about two, two and a half weeks on site going through and doing our detailed substantive testing at that point, looking at bank reconciliations, uh, looking through the confirmation process, looking at debt transactions, a wide variety of the city's transactions for the course of the year. The end culmination of that process is um, in the documents you have before you this evening. And as, as part of our audit of the city, we actually issue a total of 11 documents, five of which were included in your packet for this meeting's evening. The comprehensive annual financial report, your auditor's communication to the city council and management, your management letter as required by Illinois compiled statutes, the TIF examination report, 
your pension allocation report. Those are the five that are included again this evening. Other reports that we issued, there's two separate reports issued for the police pension fund, the fire pension fund, as well as for Tricom Central Dispatch. The final report, the 12th report that we are working with the city to issue is the annual report filed with the state comptroller. However, as of this point, the state comptroller has not yet opened their system for filing of 2017 reports, so we're monitoring that as soon as that's available. I'll upload that information for the city, complete that filing as well for you. This evening, my presentation will briefly cover the comprehensive annual financial report. I'd be happy to address any questions on any of the other documents that you have before you. Before I get into the specifics of the report, I do want to commend the city for preparation of the comprehensive annual financial report. The comprehensive annual financial report, or CAFR, goes well above and beyond the minimum re reporting requirements of both Illinois compiled statutes and generally accepted accounting principles. The city voluntarily prepares this document in the spirit of full disclosure, accountability, and transparency to your residents, taxpayers, and those interested in the city's financial position and changes in financial position. Less than 1% of all governments with a population under 25,000 prepare this comprehensive annual financial report and receive an unmodified opinion, the highest level of assurance that we can provide on your financial statements. So again, we do commend the, the city for receipt of, the, of both of those items. And we encourage you as a council to continue to set policies and procedures necessary to prepare this document and to receive that unmodified opinion. In the packet this evening, I'll give page numbers for both the bound document as well as the page numbers in the packet. But the first item I'd like to cover is the letter of transmittal. This is on page Roman numeral I or page 43 of your packet this evening. The letter of transmittal is really a unique component to the comprehensive annual financial report as this is the one opportunity for management to provide subjective discussion of the city's operations as well as looking at future expectations. We do recommend reading the letter of transmittal in conjunction with the management's discussion and analysis, which I'll discuss in just a moment. On page Roman numeral 7 or page 49, I want to congratulate the city on receipt of the Certificate of Achievement from the Government Finance Officers Association, or GFOA. As part of an annual process, the city submits this report to the GFOA and undergoes a thorough review by both GFOA staff as well as uh, program reviewers to determine that the report meets all program requirements. Sorry, Mr. Savini, I was going to ask uh, Rita to work with our IT folks just to put Get it on, the, on screen? the screen. Yeah, because this Absolutely. is scaring the devil out of me. So it's like, <laughs> if we're talking audits and we see a fire hydrant, that's, our folks at home might be thinking, what? I think it was on here, so if it's, I can actually probably. Um, That work? Yeah, put a full screen if you could. That'd sure. be awesome. Hundred percent would be wonderful. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Our independent auditor's report, a printed on sickage letterhead, can be found on pages one through three or fifty one through fifty three in your packet this evening. Highlight a couple items on this page for you. First, management's responsibility for the financial statements. Management is ultimately responsible for the presentation of the financial statements in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Our responsibility as auditors is outlined in the next few paragraphs. Our responsibility is to issue an opinion on the financial statements based on our audit procedures, and we perform our audit in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards. The city did not expend greater than $750,000 in federal awards this year, so therefore you are not required to undergo what we call a single audit of the federal expenditures. On the next page, you'll see our opinion section. Again, we're pleased to report we've issued a clean, unmodified opinion on the city's financial statements. This means that in our opinion, the financial statements are fairly presented in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles and are free of material misstatement. Skipping back a few pages to pages MD and A1 or page 55, the city does a very good job in preparing its management's discussion and analysis. and. If you're reviewing the report with users of the financial statements, or encourage them to read, if they're, if they're going to read nothing else within the comprehensive annual financial report, the management's discussion and analysis in conjunction with the letter of transmittal is really time well spent in terms of the information presented here. The management's discussion and analysis presents a very good discussion of what transpired during the last year from a financial standpoint, along with the comparative analysis to fiscal year 2016. I think the most important part of this section, though, is that it actually provides management the one opportunity they have to explain the underlying reasons for why things change from fiscal 2016 to fiscal 2017. I'm going to move past the rest of the pages in the management's discussion and analysis. We're going to come to page four, 
Page four, the document, the statement of net position. This is pages 66 and 67 in your packet. The statement of net position is presented on the economic resources measurement focus and the full accrual basis of accounting intended to provide a long-term perspective of how the city is doing from a financial standpoint. The best metric to look at on this page is the second line from the bottom on page five, the unrestricted net position. For your governmental activities, these are your taxpayer supported funds. So you're a deficit position of about $19 million for your governmental activities. Now as a reminder, looking at that $19 million deficit, that's primarily driven by the city's net pension liabilities for the Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund, Police Pension Fund, and Firefighters Pension Fund. The business type activities include your electric fund, your water fund, all of your self-supporting funds. You'll see that your unrestricted net position for your business type activity is just under $16 million for the year, the majority of that which resides in the electric fund. The next two pages present the statement of activities. This is your long-term income statement for the city. Focusing on the bottom of page seven, the third line from the bottom is the change in net position for the year. Your governmental activities decreased by $1.6 million during the year. This is primarily due to depreciation on the city's capital assets that, were out, that outpaced your uh, current year capital asset additions. Your business type activities are up a little uh, over $1.6 million, primarily driven by increases in the electric fund. Pages eight and nine, your balance sheet for your governmental funds is presented on what we call the current financial resources measurement focus on the modified accrual basis of accounting. As finance manager Cruz noted, you have a uh, fund balance policy that requires a minimum 25% target for your unassigned fund balance in your general fund. So that's the 4,770,167. When you compare that amount to your total general fund expenditures a few pages back of 15.4 million, again, that number is 30.8%. So in compliance with your fund balance policy, as of April 30th, 2017. Staying on this page, your statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance for your governmental funds, your general fund net change in fund balance for the year, just, over, just under $670,000 for the year. Again, primarily driven by um, savings on the highways and streets function related to last year's mild winter. I'm gonna skip ahead quite a bit in the report and focus on a few numbers related to the uh, pensions for you. So on page 71 through 73 or 134 through 136 in the packet, these are the schedule of employer contributions related to the city's pen uh, pension fund. So your Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund, IMRF, as well as your Police and Firefighters Pension Fund. You'll see for IMRF that the city contributed the full actuarially determined contribution of 828,000 in 2016, 805,000 in 2017. For, FISC, for the Police Pension Fund, your 2017 contribution, $1.3 million, up from about $1.1 million in 2016. And finally, the Firefighters Pension Fund uh, increased a contribution from 355000 to 434000 Continuing on in the uh, what we call the required supplementary information, on page 74, 137 of the packet, you'll see this is the schedule of the city's proportionate share of the net pension liability. So because Tricom Central Dispatch is included as part of the uh, IMRF reporting entity for the city, we have to do an allocation report that breaks out the city's portion versus TRICOM's portion. So as of December 31st, 2016, which is IMRF's measurement date, that amount was 82.19%. Your proportionate share of the net pension liability, the city's proportionate share, was 5,469,894 as of, again, as of December 31st. The next two pages, pages 75 and 76 of the report, this presents the schedule of changes in the employer's net pension liability and related ratio. So this section is broken into there are really three different pieces. The first portion, the total pension liability, presents the actuarially determined amounts related to the plan. The middle of the plan fiduciary net position presents the amounts held in trust and restricted for those pensions. And at the bottom, you'll see various ratios looking at the funded status of the plan. Number to focus on for the police pension fund as well as fire pension. Um, your plan fiduciary net position as a percentage of your total pension liability. For the police pension fund, 52.4%, up from about 49.6% this year, primarily driven by a good, uh, good year from the investment market standpoint. And for the firefighters pension fund, went from a 67%, 67.5% uh, to 71.5% ratio there. The last item I'll cover in the report, just skip back a few pages, skip back towards the end of the report here. As I noted, the Letter of transmittal and management's discussion and analysis present a lot of useful information in terms of looking at the city's overall financial statements and financial operations at a high level. If we look at the 
uh, section, the, uh, the stats section, which is the very back part of the report. This is another great spot to look at within the report. This provides uh, 10 years of trend data on a wide variety of topics, whether it be financial trends, revenue capacity, debt capacity, things of that nature here. Again, really kind of a great source to see where the city's at today as well as where you've been over that past 10 year period. I want to just take a moment to say, uh, thank the Council, Bank Administrator Dawkins, Finance Manager Cruz, and other city staff that assisted in providing uh, assistance throughout the course of the audit process this year. Uh, one of the things that the city should be really proud of is we only had five adjusting journal entries. With the nature of uh, the operations that the city has, to have only five entries, and of, of those five entries, only two were considered even remotely significant entries for that, really speaks to the quality of the finance staff at the city and the um, quality of the information provided as part of the audit process for that. And certainly, as uh, Finance Manager Cruz noted, uh, this is the last year of our contract with the city. I want to thank the, the mayor and the council for the opportunity to work with the city uh, over the last four years. We're proud of the work that we've done with the city. I'm hopeful to, as you go through the RFP, RFP process, we'll be the, afforded the chance to work with the, uh, the city into the future. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have on the comprehensive annual financial report or any of the other documents this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the dais? Alderman Marks. Have a few of here, didn't you? So I looked at my right <laughs> first. <laughs> just, I know you, Sikich sees a lot of event of, of government. So, just to put in perspective for us, the police and, and firefighters, pension funds, you know, with being 52% funded in 71, is that normal for, or is it better? I would, I would say that it's from a benchmark standpoint that, that you're pretty much, I would say right in the middle of, okay. of where kind of where we see things um, from a, an overall standpoint. I say those ranges anywhere from probably 40 to uh, the 75 percent uh, based on, on kind of where we see the various levels at that. Yeah, I mean, is it still the rule of thumb with those kinds of deferred compensation, uh, deferred benefit plans that? right around 85 to 90 percent is almost fully funded is is that still pretty much the sure, sure. and then the there's been a lot of discussion certainly with the uh you know single employer police and fire plans in, in illinois on that we've had a lot of you know, the, the state has a policy in place that you have to be you know 90 percent funded by 2040 on that using what they call the projected unit credit actuarial method for that now that method actually the governmental accounting standards board came out and said well you need to base your accounting on 100 percent funding using a completely different actuarial method for that the problem with the actuarial valuations, and you can see if you go back, if I may, to the uh, required supplementary information, is even if you're funding at the full levels that the actuary is determining as part of that, yeah. there's going to be actuarial assumptions that are changing as part of that. Um, and, and really, I can kind of give you a good example of that here. Um, so last year, as, a, you know, as an example, looking at your police pension fund, 2015 and 2016 as well, looking at mortality assumptions, for example, here. Um, you had $2 million increases in both 15 and 16 related to those mortality assumptions there. So even if you get to the point where you were you know, fully funded on that, you could have a, a minor change to one of the mortality tables used as part of that. So really the, the key portion of that is looking at what the actuary recommends that you contribute on an annual basis for that, contributing uh, that full amount to the extent possible on that, and then looking at the assumptions the actuary is using to ensure that those are reasonable assumptions and the plan is being funded using reasonable assumptions. Are they still using seven and a half percent return? Oh, they've gone down to uh, seven and a quarter percent for the for this current value. I wish we could make that. <laughs> um, okay, I, you know, could you also go through the internal control report? I don't know. If sure, you're, absolutely. Willing, just because that that's usually um, always an interesting area to absolutely. go through. I mean, it, there's nothing I think major in here, but I think it does help um, some of the council members. Absolutely, I'd be happy to. <clears throat> So our internal control recommendations are incorporated within our auditor's communication to the members of the city council and management. So this document includes several different pieces. The first piece, our required communication with those charged with governance. That's our standard audit letter. That's the old, uh, what we used to call the SAS 114 letter. I'm going to skip past that information. Look here at the journal entry. So again, as, as I noted, there are only five journal entries throughout the course of the year for that. Um, as you can see, a couple of those amounts were, you know, the 
Entry five here, uh, very small dollar amounts. Again, same thing for uh, entry three and, and really entry one as well. Entry two and four related to debt entries and a few year-end accrual entries were a little bit larger, but again, a uh, very small number of entries there. Our past adjustment schedule just relate to a couple of uh, prior year items that are flowing through this year. And then our uh, management letter document. So our first comment is related to part of the year-end adjustments there, just being able to um, look at those long-term debt amounts as well as the uh, certain state shared revenues. This is part of the year-end close process to ensure that there are um, appropriate reviews of that information being able to go through and, and verify that you know, the amounts recorded. So using the, uh, the state shared revenues as an example for that, not only are the, the 12 months recorded, but they're the appropriate 12 months that are recorded as part of that. The second comment we had just relates to payroll internal controls and being able to, uh, any time that we look at from an internal control standpoint, one of the primary concerns and primary things that we look for is, is adequate segregation of duties for that. So being able to have appropriate controls within the system to either segregate those duties or if there's not an opportunity to segregate those duties, uh, limit controls within the system or run other reports to be able to do that. So that's a recommendation here is to, um, one of the recommendations, generate a master file change log within the system that allows us to see any changes that have been made as part of that process and reviewing that along with the payroll process there. Uh, the final comment that we had for this year just relates to uh, decentralized cash receding. Uh, certainly in uh, municipal ent environment we see uh, regularly there's different departments that are accepting cash as part of the ongoing operations for the city on that. Uh, the city has worked to kind of normalize and standardize that process across various departments there, uh, just looking at uh, one certain amounts related to cash receipts, um, I think in the police department that are just some minor adjustments that we're recommending to align that with what the city is doing across other departments and other locations on that. Other comments, just, uh, future accounting pronouncements are all listed uh, within the, uh, the report as well. If we skip back a few pages, you'll see Appendix A, which is the status of the prior year recommendations. Our recommendations related to prior years relate to, again, looking at those IT and user access controls, being able to do that. That comment was considered partially implemented this year. Uh, city did implement a computer lock policy related to that and have individual accounts. Do continue to recommend that the city go through, look at those user access controls and determine that uh, individuals have the appropriate responsibilities based on their, uh, their job requirements and what they need to do for that. Report review and work paper schedule reconciliation is considered implemented, as well as a public works cash handling comment, uh, items two and three there. Items four are related to workers' compensation, considered implemented. Item five related to the insurance fund, um, considered implemented. And the pump to build ratio as well due to the uh, actions taken uh, regards to that ratio have been implemented as well. So all in all, a very, um, and in terms of how we address those comments, there's, there's three levels that we have from a comment standpoint, what we call our deficiencies. If there was anything that elevated to a higher level that would potentially be classified as a significant deficiency or material weakness, we had none of those items to report at the, either of the elevated levels for that. that. That was it for me. Thank you. Rita, nice job. And, and your staff, it really, um, it's nice to keep getting these clean bill of health. Um, so thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Alderman Radecki. Got one quick question maybe for Rita. Do we pay anything to the Government Finance Officers Association? They're the ones, yeah. Yes, there are three things we pay for. We pay for an annual membership. Um, we pay to have them review the CAFR, the budget, the budget, and also the PAFR, which is what we just won last year. Right. And then if there's any training that any, any of my staff attend, we also pay for that as well. So you do pay for the, the award, is that what I heard you say? Yes. How much is that? I'm going to say around $400. OK. I guess the question is, do you, is it worth paying for that? I mean, it, it's kind of a little disingenuous if you're paying them and then you get an award back for it. I mean, are you getting something back for that? What's the, what's the return for the $400? Not just getting the award, but having, um, knowing, I guess you can say getting the award, you know, that is a standard that we do run without within all of the country is that is a lot that's a higher level than just creating a CAFR and not getting the word there are higher standards that we are putting in this document as well plus when you look at bond um, you know S&P and the bond rating agencies they want to see a CAFR award they want to see a complete document they do wait you know it's ways better than looking at it after right. which would be a far uh, thank one you that's lower thanks 
Um, Alderman Bruno. Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, that uh, just to put a finer point on that. So the four hundred dollars is isn't for the award. It is for them to review the reports to receive the award. Is it is it guaranteed that that award? So it's not guaranteed. So the the process is part of that. What that what the city's comprehensive annual financial report goes through. Then at first it goes through a review by staff of the government finance officers association. They review that report. And it also goes to three, what, they, what GFOA calls their special review committee. So three members outside of Illinois who actually go through and look at that report as well. What the city gets from that in addition to the items uh, finance manager Cruz mentioned in terms of the a favorable view from the rating agencies and others uh, on that is every year as part of that review process, comments are provided back to the city in terms of any recommendation, recommended changes for that gives the city a chance to incorporate any best practices that GFOA sees from across the country in terms of especially implementing new pronouncements. So Gatsby statement number 68. Um, so the city then implements those comments as part of the, the audit process and be able to go through and, and make sure that not only meets the requirements of um, compiled statutes, but as well as the uh, GFOA certificate program as well. So in a sense, it is a third set of eyes that looks at what we're doing and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Correct. Thank you. Anyone else in the dais? <clears throat> Alderman Kilberg, your microphone, please, sir. Just, just to comment on that, I think that would be very similar to our fire department and some of the, uh, I was gonna say the same thing. Uh, some of the, uh, the the processes that are in place where you have national review, and uh, I don't know if there's actually any fees involved with the recognition or the award that goes with that, but um, I think that it's good that uh, you have that extra set of eyes. Uh, from outside the community or from an auditing firm such as yours that uh, that takes a look at uh, the overall operation and, and uh, identifies ways that can be approved upon. Uh, I don't think that that should be considered as uh, as buying a recognition necessarily, but uh, I think it's uh, it's somewhat of an insurance policy that we uh, we are doing well. Thank you. Thank you both very, very much. Thank you, sir. We're at item 10 on the agenda. Oh, forgive me. We have, we have a motion by Marks and a second by, I believe it's Swanson, to accept the 2017 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, otherwise known as CAFR. We'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Clerk? Mike Bruno. Aye. Sarah Burkhart. Aye. Don Cummings. Aye. Becky Ruby. Aye. Amy Kilberg. Aye. Craig Melandra. Aye. Richard Mark. Aye. Ian McGowan. Aye. Jim Radecki. Aye. Robert Swanson. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Skipping down to item 10, municipal bills for payment. We kindly ask our city clerk to read the bills in their aggregate, available in your packet and online for our consideration. Total bills presented for payment, $1,506,077.05. Uh, Mayor, I move that we approve and pay the bills as read. The individual items that add up to that amount can be found in tonight's city council packet. So motion by Bruno to pay the bills as presented. Second. Seconded by Alderman Ruby. Questions or comments regarding the bills? Mr. Clerk, please take the roll. Mike Bruno. Aye. Sarah Burkhart. Aye. Don Cummings. Aye. Becky Ruby. Aye. Dean Kilberg. Aye. Craig Balaja. Aye. Richard Mark. Aye. Kim McGowan. Aye. Kim Redecki. Aye. Robert Smith. Aye. Item 10 passes unanimously. We skip, oh, excuse me, we head to item 11, Committee of the Whole Items of Business. Item 11A is consider ordinance number 2017 23, rezoning 401 North 1st Street from the R6 medium density two and three family residential district to the R7 multiple family residential district presented by CMM Holdings LLC. So moved. Motion by Marks. Second. Seconded by Bruno. This matter is on the floor for discussion. We will entertain comments from the dais first and then we'll invite our audience members to provide any comments they'd like as well. Anyone from the dais? Alderman Bruno. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> 
Last week I voted uh, negative on both of these uh, items looking at totality, but uh, um, I've been considering the R7 density in terms of the uh, how it protects the neighboring properties with a 25-foot uh, setback versus a uh, 6-foot setback. Um, I'm thinking based on that, I am uh, much more likely to vote for item 11A. Anyone else on the dais on uh, item 11A, just the rezoning? <coughs> on the matter regarding the rezoning, item 11A, anyone in the audience wish to ask questions? And by all means, come up to the podium. Please reintroduce yourself with your address. Um, I will kindly ask that all comments be delivered to the chair. And then if uh, professional staff needs to respond, I will direct said staff is to do so. Questions or is it comments also? Questions or comments okay. on item 11A, just the rezoning. Right. So not the plan itself. My name is Linda Mazur and I live at 513 North 1st Street. You're probably sick of seeing me. Um, good evening, Alderwomen, Aldermen, Mayor Burns, Attorney Radovich. Um, let's see, I'm actually a little more organized tonight. I'm just going to start out by saying that all of those, uh, those of us who spoke at the plan commission and the committee of the whole, and again this evening, do so independently of one another. I do not believe that any one residential neighborhood is more special than another. Like all other neighborhoods in the city of Geneva, we raise our children, go to work, pay our taxes, and enjoy the city and enjoy the stability, or no, and enjoy the city we call home. Just like any one of you. We want to preserve the character of our neighborhood, have a feeling of stability, and protect our financial investments. I want to make it perfectly clear, anything that I have to say regarding this development is in no way a reflection on Mr. Hogan or an attack on his character. I do not even know this gentleman. However, the fact that he is a nice guy or the amount of time he has expended on this project is not a valid reason for approving it. It is a risk you take when you're in the profession and propose a development asking for zoning change. I'm not attacking anybody, but I was wondering, may I hand out these papers? Um, what are the papers? Are the papers? Well, they're what I'm going to read, and I thought it would oh, be by all means. Of easier for them those. to follow. Absolutely. Happy to do so. Yeah, present mine to the clerk. Yeah, that's okay. We're, we're going to make sure it enters the official record as well, without objection. trusting me to know what I'm doing here. David, I pull this drawer out. <laughs> See, I'm already failing. Oh, here we go. Oh, and the mouse. Now you tell me, hit this button, or this folder right here. Did I do it? I did it. All right. Thanks, David. You click on the first one, and then there should be an arrow key. Oh, that's right. I can look right here. Okay, now I, all this is is eight pictures of the home that is immediately... Okay, this is the home immediately next to the proposed lot to the north. Let's see. And this should be his backyard. You'll notice he has that little deck, and then you see that open space. That's where that development is going to run across the back because I believe his home is, what, 35 feet? I, I can't recall. But the, the project is 66, so that's his backyard. And then next to this, the next house, is our, our lovely townhouses. And that's their front yard. It's a two family. And then their backyard is this. And again, this project is going to go well beyond this. And I'm just going to give you the third house. So I'm going from Stevens Street, and if there's a little map in there, <coughs> to what we now refer to as I guess forever vacated North Street. I mean, it doesn't exist, but it did at one time. So the third house 
is uh, this. This was a nice young family that just moved in here this year. And again, uh, let's see, there's the backyard. And that big open space is North Street vacated. And this is the house next to this. Uh, uh, that's, I think, just two views of their home. Now these first, those, this house, all the houses I showed you are, um, or not all the houses, from the duplex, from this one, so one, two, and that's it, those first two houses, no, I'm sorry, the houses that I showed you are the same size lot approximately frontage that the proposed development is on. So that gives you an idea of the scale. We've got quite a few houses there that equal, I believe, the same property size as the proposed development. That's a, to me, that's a really big difference in scale. At the community, at the committee of the whole meeting, I requested, and you can follow along if you want, that if you voted in favor of the zoning change, you verbalize, you, that you verbalize your reasons. I had three responses from aldermen to support I had three responses from aldermen to support their reason for voting in favor of the zoning change from R6 to R7. And what I heard is there is a need for this, there is a need for higher density, you have to accept change. My thoughts, a need for what? What does that mean? If you mean a large building with a rooftop deck, then no, R6 would not meet this need. What needs aren't we meeting with R6? R6 is multifamily, it's denser than R1, it offers diversity, and this parcel, according to Mr. DeGroote, can hold four, possibly five dwellings. This, in turn, provides housing for four to five families, and it is definitely more comparable and compatible with the existing neighborhood, height, mass, setback, character. R6, according to the city's own definition, is intended for older residential neighborhoods. This area certainly classifies as one. Things you should consider about our neighborhood. There aren't any east-west streets intersecting this neighborhood from Stevens Street to the St. Charles border, so it is lo one long running sidewalk. All but one of the front yard setbacks are 25 feet, including the two family townhomes from Stevens Street to the St. Charles border. If you approve this, there will be three different res residential zonings within about 247 feet all fronting the same continuous sidewalk and street. I heard this comment from an alderman, I'm sorry, I don't remember who, I even watched the TV show. One alderman said there wasn't a big difference between the first street row house's proposal and keeping it as R6, so go with R7. My response is, there is a big difference between these two, and below are some of the differences. More green space, and I'm not and I didn't sit there and mathematically figure everything out, but I mean, you can kind of figure this. There's five houses with no opening in between. You have an R2, you've got a little, you know, whether it's six feet or whatever it is, you've got this feeling of more of openness and green space, and I don't know, we all seem to live together fine here. Uh, provides, div uh, oh, the, obviously, the first street, less of an open field with reduced natural light Oh, I'm going out of order. <laughs> With reduced natural light to the adjacent property, R6, more of an open field, and more natural light to adjacent properties. More compatible with three out of four surroundings. R7, compatible with one out of four surroundings, and I think that is questionable. Provides, under R6, provides diversity and density without compromising existing neighborhood. Obviously, in R7, I I don't think it provides diversity, but it does compromise the character. The maximum building height is 35 feet. Building height for this project, 45.3 at the rear of the building, 10.3 feet higher. Front of the building, 35.9 feet with greenhouses, nine inches over ordinance. Maximum lot coverage in R6 is 60%. Maximum lot coverage in this proposal is 65. Permitted uses in R6 are single, two, and three family dwellings. Under R7, it's attached dwellings, community living centers, group homes up to 15 people, parks and recreation uses, senior apartments, senior housing, 
two and three family dwellings and no single family homes allowed. Continued on page three under R6, I, I felt it does not infringe upon or negatively affect the quality of life of the single family home adjacent to the north of the property. The R6 scale is more a more appropriate fit. R7 does negatively affect the quality of life and is disproportionate to the surrounding site. Adhering to R6 with this neighborhood will make future developments within the same neighborhood easier to, uh, easier to approve and develop cohesively. There are three lots at the eastern end of Stevens, two lots on North River Lane with one single family R1 home on the lot at the dead end of North River Lane, and at least three of these lots are have different owners. R6 does not set a precedent for future R7 zoning in this block. R7 does. And then my notation is, and this is in regards to the variances, but there was no way to compare it to R6. R7 requires a 25-foot transitional setback and a 20-foot street setback. This is a total of 45 feet. Mass not my strong suit, but uh, so this is a total of 45 feet for the north and south sides combined. First Street row houses are providing transitional setback of 21.77 and a street back of a street setback of 7.5. This in my math is a total of 29.27 feet for the north and south sides combined. This is a total shortage of 15.73 feet for the north and south sides combined. And you heard me say this last week, I'll just briefly outlined it. City of Geneva's comprehensive plan, goals and objectives, housing and residential area, page 3.2, maintain the scale, quality and character of, exi of existing single family, protect residential area from encroachment of land use and the adverse impacts of adjacent activities, ensure that home improvements, additions and new housing construction are compatible with and complement and enha enhance existing neighborhoods. So let's look at the compatibility of the surrounding area. To the north, as you saw, is up there is one single family home and I'm, I guess I can't multitask with this so I won't go back, but to the north is one single family home on an R1 lot followed by a two family townhouse, followed by two separate single family homes, followed by 23 large R1 lots and homes. All these homes are attractive and well-maintained. To the west is Park Place. I would like to point out that Park Place is not exactly comparable for the following reasons. It is developed on its own block. It does not abut any residential zoning, and one side is across from a cemetery and the other side from Wheeler Park. Three to the south and directly across from this development is a single-family home on an R1 lot side size that is now a rental. The southeast corner is old bottling. Four, to the east are three small single family home, homes presently rentals. To the northeast on River Lane is three, I, I've never been able to tell what that building is, it's been here as long as I lived here, family building, and two single family homes. I know one is on an R1 lot, and I think the other one is two now that North Street's been vacated, but I can't say with certainty. One is a rental and one is lived in by the owner. Finally, <clears throat> from Stevens to the St. Charles border, this development would be the only building of this height. The shortest front yard setback, and I know he is not required to have a 25 set foot setback, it's just a fact. It will be the smallest because even the townhouses, whoever developed that did a lovely job and moved it back to match the homes. Um, and only the building, uh, and the only building to have five attached family units on the block. Presently, the largest is two. How is this compatible and complement this neighborhood? I would respectfully answer, it does not. Um, I guess that's uh, all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Mazur. Yes, you're welcome. David. Oh, this door. Yeah. Now, can I just pull it out or do I have to hit each other? Excuse me. Thank you, David. Uh, 
Before you begin, sir, uh, David, could I trouble you to remove this shot from the screen? Last thing I want is the homeowners to tune in and say, why is my house up here on this thing? And it's like, no, that's quite all right. It's, we've had that experience before. <laughs> Thank you very much. Alderman Ruby? Can, can we address some of Linda's points, or should we wait until everyone... I'll is? defer to the council. Um, do you want to address them as they fly, or do you prefer at the end? Chairman suggests at the end. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Since there were no nodding of heads or anything. Welcome, sir. Hi, I'm John Mazur. I live at 53 North 1st Street. Uh, Sometimes it's difficult to get a feel for the scale of these projects when you look at two-dimensional figures and pictures. Uh, so I spent some time playing around in the garage and created a model. And I would like to show you the model because I think it gives, again, a little bit of the proportion, the size of the building that is proposed in relationship to the lot and also the size of the building compared to the house next door. So, forgive my amateurish attempts, but this actually is to scale. And no, I'm okay. Um, so there's uh, 66 feet going back here, and uh, there's only seven and a half feet uh, on the south side and a setback of 20 feet on the west side. The land does slope away, so the heights are just based on... Sir, if I could trouble you to speak closer to the microphone, our, our producer just said that he can't quite pick your voice up. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, the, the land slopes away, but I wasn't uh, able to make a model that complicated yet. Just uh, started this today. Uh, Did you have a permit for that model, sir? I do not, sorry. <laughs> I would like to make a life-size life model, but I'm still uh, working on that. So anyway, uh, I think you can generally see that there's a huge proportion uh, difference, and there isn't much open land. And what I also don't show is that the uh, driveway and alley takes up most of the space in back. So these silly little stripe things are the uh, greenhouses uh, that apparently hold the elevator and the stairs going upwards. And apparently uh, the plan is to put uh, uh, living space on the roof. Are there any questions that I can help anybody with in terms of the model? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Good evening, uh, Miles Mulner, 417 North 1st Street. Um, I know that the amendment we're on is just the rezoning in itself, but I figured I'd speak up now. Uh, just my uh, comments mainly focus on just the uh, zoning uh, ordinance by the city of Geneva. And I gotta say, first off, when I first moved here in March, I really never thought I'd be spending this much time here, especially during a NFL football season. But I think it is important, um, not just this one product, I think it's the precedent that it's gonna set. Uh, the sheer height of the, uh, the building with the rooftop decks, um, you're gonna see a downfall of next project. Will you approve this one? Here we go. And then we're gonna start playing Yertle the Turtle, who's king of the mountain over here. Um, but I did just wanna point out, uh, you know, and I got, I got this right off uh, the city of Geneva's website for the I think it was called the Municicode Library, but um, section 11-51-4, uh, lot and area requirements for R7. Um, you know, they talk about the traditional uh, transitional setback 
wherever it butts R7 butts up to an R1 or R, R whatever the single family residence code is, is 25 feet. Uh, this proposed project is only 21 and a half. There's also a note here, um, and I could be wrong, I don't know how <laughs> to read this, but it's uh, uh, note one, it says plus one foot for each two feet by which the building or structure exceeds 25 feet in height. Now I was confused, uh, I don't read city codes and a whole lot, but is that, this building's over 40 feet, so would that be additional footage? setback requirements? Uh, we'll have Mr. DeGroote respond to that. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to ask too is um, under the same 11-51-4 item E, uh, maximum floor area ratio uh, in the R7 district, the maximum allowable floor area ratio uh, <coughs> shall be two for all uses. And I might be answering my own question here, but since the city of Geneva does not have any uh, regulations on rooftop decks how does that factor into this because the rooftop decks are defined as livable space wouldn't that essentially throw off this ratio as well and maybe because there's no regulations in place um, some to think about so thank you thank you mr. Norman <clears throat> anyone else in the audience before I invite the applicant to join us all yours, sir. Leave it at this scale. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Green uh, with Engineering Resource Associates. I'm the project civil engineer and planner, and I represent the applicant, um, Hogan Design and Construction. And I wanted to um, start with, uh, with a to scale uh, rendering um, that has some color on it and um, is proportionate based on our submitted architectural plans. This rendering is based on AutoCAD and some uh, actual site photographs and scale dimensions off the survey that we provided to you. I'll use the mouse to point on both sides. Um, this is a um, um, timeless colonial architecture design. Uh, the first floor windows kind of line up with the first floor windows of the home right next door. And then the, um, the second floor windows perhaps also line up with the windows next door and um, Although this is a perspective view from a distance, um, the greenhouse enclosures shown on the roof area are, are actually set back some 25 or 30 feet from the front elevation. And although this perspective may actually be perhaps 100 feet away or so um, from the street level, uh, where you can see the park place product right across the street as three full stories above grade plus a shingled roof uh, at perhaps a 4 1 or 4 12, 5 12 roof pitch. This project is unique because after our second floor, we have a flat roof and then a 36 inch parapet wall. So, from a perspective point of view, uh, unless we're you know, fl flying in a drone kind of looking at this property, uh, these glass greenhouses, if you would, that actually enclose our elevator and our stairway are, are limited to a uh, perhaps an area smaller than what's boxed in here between all of us. And it's really just for stairway access and an elevator access and it's set back. So really not visible from the street uh, as you're walking on either side of uh, First Street. Uh, and then for sake of reference, the single family home to the north of us, um, the, the, uh, the 412 or 512 roof pitch is actually higher than the top of our parapet wall. So. Um, since we're talking of scales and models and that, I just want to illustrate here that um, you know, we have set the foundation 
uh, for this building, you know, actually below street level because the grade does slope off towards the river. And we've done some things with the foundation to, of course, tuck the garages into lower level. And a lot of these height variances that we're talking about are because in this particular zoning district, the, the building height is measured around all four sides of the building. So as much of it's, it's, it's a benefit or an amenity that we're able to tuck the garages out of sight from the road below grade, uh, and that there's actually a basement level below grade here, um, this, the height numbers we're talking about are actually measured from the garage floor, which you could argue is the basement floor, uh, which is actually about nine or 10 feet lower than this front doorway here on the front elevation. So I just wanna, just wanna point that out. This is a uh, aerial of the neighborhood, and um, I'm going to come back to this in a moment, but I'm going to point out some things regarding the Stephen Street right away. Uh, most of your platted right aways in town are either 60 or 66 feet wide. Uh, the publicly owned Stephen Street right away is actually 80 feet wide in front of this project. And um, I'll start over here on the Park Place project. Park Place was granted a setback variance off of Stevens of about 11 feet or so. And the sidewalk over there is traditionally one foot out into the right of way. So that as you're walking along the sidewalk here, uh, the building feels like it's about 12 feet away from the sidewalk. I'm gonna point you over to Stevens Street here and, and for a reason, Stevens Street is actually skewed to the south. Uh, perhaps that's because these two single family home sites east of us are actually in the public right of way. Um, these two homes here um, both have their front seven foot porches overlapping the front lot line. So, um, from a perspective standpoint, when you're, when you're walking on the sidewalk here, these homes seem kind of close. They are, they're about five feet off the sidewalk, but they're also about seven feet into the public right of way. So, um, the sidewalk here now adjacent to our project, where I'm hovering over with the mouse, you can see there's some power lines there, but the sidewalk is skewed, you know, perhaps because of some of these encroachments here. But there's an extra uh, 12 or 13 feet of, of grassy space. So um, in, the, in the testimony from Plan Commission, you recall we talked about that we worked with Plan Commission and it was the flavor of the commission to shift the building a little bit to the south. Uh, in favor of maximizing the north setback up here for the transitional zoning, and, and we did just that. We increased the setback to almost 22 feet on the north side. On the south side, uh, they voted favorably, seven to one, for us to have about a seven foot setback. But actually, when you add it to the about 13 feet of extra grass behind the sidewalk, uh, for all intents and purposes, this is a unique situation in town where we have an 80-foot right-of-way with the entire public roadway system and sidewalk shifted south. Uh, we actually have, it looks and feels, like a 20-foot measurement from the sidewalk that's existing uh, to the closest facade of our building. And this is based on real live GIS photography I'm showing here. I wanna go through some of the architectural renderings here. Um, there was an intent by the architect. John, oh, yes. Uh, we can we can leave the architectural running room discussion to the next item on okay. the agenda. This sure. is strictly a zoning matter. Sure. Okay. So we'd like to stick to the script if possible. That's fine. Do you have any other comments you'd like to make with respect to the zoning? Um, yes, I have one final comment on Thank that. Thank you, sir. This is the comprehensive plan from 2002 that uh, was commissioned by the city. Uh, Housel Levine completed this plan. And the subject property, as I'm talking, I'll look for it, uh, refers to our site as um, uh, specific development opportunity uh, two, I believe it is, uh, that calls for, um, oh, did I? Okay. Specifically, the 2002 uh, comprehensive plan talks about, there, there we are, yes, very nice. Thanks, David. Um, talks about opportunity. It's an opportunity site. And the proposed PUD before you uh, is um, more or less in conformance with this opportunity site. It's been compared to quite a bit to 
the Park Place development to the west of us, and it's also been compared that we're more or less surrounded by R6 zoning. Um, uh, the main thing I want to point out here is this comprehensive plan is dated 2002. Um, the, there was testimony at the plan commission meeting that the current zoning code, uh, I think, was last modified in 1995. Uh, so I, I believe staff and some others have talked that there's actually a disconnect between the fact that the comp plan is asking for something different than the zoning code has. When I think it's a matter of the fact that the zoning, when the city council voted in the comprehensive plan which in this document, um, a housekeeping item that never took place with the zoning code updated to match the plan. Because if this plan, which is dated 02, is what, is what the flavor of the council was to have for this area and others, then it would have made sense by matter of protocol that the zoning map be brought up to speed. Otherwise, the city's in a situation where there's perhaps some conflicting documents. Um, the last thing I want to mention while we're on this plan is um, um, this is the subject property right here. And it, it's been compared to R7 across the street, of course, R6 to the north. But I want to call your attention to the bottling works property, which is south of us. Um, the, the subject property could be looked at transitional zoning in its own right from that property. That's an entire city block, and uh, many of the duplex properties along first in this front edge are currently rentals, and many are owned under the same ownership group as Bottling Works. And um, there is, uh, inconsistent with this plan in this sketch down here, there is perhaps plan, this was what was approved in 2002, uh, for higher density, and additional levels of building. Uh, of course, it would all have to come through the plan commission and a council process, but um, this bottling work site here um, can be shown down here. Perhaps with taking advantage of the grade, uh, this is the bottling work site. It, sh it shows perhaps maybe one or two levels of parking, either at street level or below grade. And then the comp plan shows perhaps three or four stories above it. And again, keep in mind, this opportunity site is right across the street from the Shodin development, uh, which is multiple stories from years and years ago. So um, I ask you to consider when you're looking at the merits of our application uh, to realize that this property, although it's coming first before what the 2002 plan called for for this entire block, when it's looked at as a whole with these neighborhoods together, uh, you begin to see how everything fits together nicely, consistent with the plan that the council adopted in 02. So, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. DeGroote, I believe there are a couple of questions we'd love for you to address, if you would. I know I'm going to defer to Alderman Ruby. I believe she had. Well, one thing I did want to clarify is that the downtown master plan was adopted in 2012, not 2002, and then amended again in 2013. Uh, the city did begin to uh, amend the zoning regulations to align with the, the visions in the plan. Um, we did so with um, some assistance we obtained through a grant uh, that unfortunately wasn't enough to cover it, so the city council did approve in our budget for this fiscal year to resume that project and carry that out. We have meetings scheduled with the consultant this week to kind of rev um, look at the scope of work of what's left to do um, to carry that, that update out. Um, there was a, a question regarding the side yard setback and an additional uh, setback requirement for every foot over 25 feet. That note applies to a side yard setback. Um, it, as it's listed in the zoning or ordinance, that is a transitional yard setback, which is just the minimum 25 feet. So that, that additional setback requirement would be if you had like two R7 buildings next to each other over 25 feet, that additional setback would, would apply. But, but in this case, it's just the minimum of 25 feet. I don't know if there was anything I Alderman Ruby? <laughs> just a couple of things that I noted in um, Linda's presentation. And David, you can confirm, I'm going from memory. Um, so R6, the maximum is four units, correct? It can't be four or five. Wasn't didn't it max out at four? And because this was five units, that's why the R seven was needed. Right. In the in the R six district, you can only have up to three dwelling units attached in one building. Okay. Um, this lot would be big enough to accommodate up to six units total, so two two three unit buildings. Okay. Um, and then the height w was just. 
addressed, but just to reiterate, um, so the, the building height in R7, the max is 35 feet, and we're looking at 45.3, um, but that's with the, the greenhouse? That's with the greenhouse and as measured from the, the east side of the building, so from the, the floor of the garage to the peak of the greenhouse structure. Okay, so just out of curiosity, what is, how many feet is the building without the greenhouse? I think the greenhouse adds another nine and a half feet, so it's it would be just I think it's like thirty six feet. Okay. Okay, and her comments about um, green space, um, I I guess that coincides with lot coverage, which the difference is only um, it goes from sixty percent to sixty five percent, but it. I, I have the feeling that there's more green space with R7, and I don't know how to, why I think that, or how to, how to explain that. But is that? There's, there's an, a, a larger setback to the property to the north with the R7 district, but the overall impervious surface, building, sidewalks, driveways, would actually be greater in the R7 district. Okay. Um. And can we see a visual of the um, Stevens Street, the setback that's seven and a half instead of 20 feet? I'm going the wrong way. And I know um, John addressed this also. <laughs> and had a good explanation for it and that I can't reiterate. <laughs> so the, the building here is set back seven and a half feet from the property line, which is this thicker black line here. Okay. You can see the public sidewalk as it exists now is at its greatest point, probably another 12 feet or so um, from, the, from the actual property line. So the, the setback of seven and a half feet is, is measured from here to the building. But from the public sidewalk, it's going to feel more like in the 17 to 20 foot range. Okay, but for zoning purposes, the setbacks are measured from the property line. Correct. Okay. So from the property line, it's seven and a half feet, but it's actually 19 feet from the sidewalk. Right. Okay. Um, and then I guess I, I just had one question for um, for anyone who is opposed to this. Um, I'm just curious, and I'm not sure if this is the time to ask or if we should wait until the next item, but um, I, I know there's been a lot of talk about um, you know, some sort of compromise in a win-win situation, and I, I don't know what that might be. I'm curious if you have any specifics on that. I'd like to reserve that question okay. for the PUD section, okay. of the yep. consider, if that's okay. Sure, yep, absolutely. Unless it's a zoning matter in particular. Okay. But yep, got yeah. ahead. Thank you. Anyone else on the dais? <clears throat> Questions, comments, clarifications? Alderman Rudecki? Yeah, I guess I have one, just a couple of quick comments. Um, one is that I am of the opinion, you know, our comprehensive plan specifically says single family attached row houses. I think that clearly states what the purpose and intent was and what we wanted. And I think it's a valid argument that that our perhaps our zoning didn't catch up with the comprehensive plan. I think that's a very valid point. Um, and you know the, the the deal with the R7, you know, it, it gives us the opportunity to have a PUD and have more oversight, and more input with it. I think it makes sense. Um, if we leave it at R6, um, you could have three pretty utilitarian three-unit buildings put on that lot, with less of a setback to the property to the north than what this property is called for. So. Um, I guess my comment that somebody wanted to hear is I am in favor of uh, changing the zoning to R7. Thank you. Alderman Maladra, then Alderman Cummings. Um, my position is actually similar to Alderman Rudecki, but different. I am in favor of changing the zoning to R7, but only as long as we get a development like what's being proposed in the next item. I think that the the proposal in the next item includes some 
design elements, I guess is the term I'll use, that mitigate the impact of R7. In Linda's uh, handout, uh, I don't know what page it is, page two, I think, she talks about the permitted uses in R7, attached dwellings, community living centers, et cetera, et cetera. I'm actually uncomfortable going to R7 without knowing exactly what's going to go uh, on this property. And I know that's probably bad from, you know, David's perspective or Chuck's. Um, but I think I, I will... I will vote for the zoning change, um, but if the if the PUD fails, I might ask to reconsider. Alderman Cummings. Um, this is a rhetorical question, but I want to get it out there. Um, how did the meetings go between the neighbors and the builders uh, this week? It's been a week. How did everything go? and you'll get a chance to answer that. Um, next, I, I worry that in absence of, of meetings, if we stay at an R6 designation, we lose some control that we get with R7. We lose the PUD. And there's a good chance, I think, that you will end up, there is a good chance, I think, that you will end up with something that you uh, like less, but you may be happy because you've won the R6 argument. So that's my caveat. If, if there has not been a meeting and you haven't talked about design, and you're not very familiar with what can go in with R6 with a lot of leeway, or what can go in with R7 with a PUD, which controls a lot of stuff, um, it's a be careful what you wish for. I will continue to support an R6 designation on this but be careful what you wish for, especially in absence of a meeting. Thank you. Anyone else from the dais? Any comments, questions, clarifications from Mr. DeGroote or anyone else? Alderman McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as I stated last week, um, I'm still in favor of not changing the zoning from R6 to R7. Um, just to be sure, I took another walk to this location Friday afternoon. I spent my time carefully observing the area, carefully observing the surrounding homes, the scale. One of the reasons that I was compelled to run for Fourth Ward Alderman is because I was so disappointed that Park Place was able to go in. And I don't like Park Place, and, the, and I didn't even want to focus on that. So to me, um, I like this building. Nothing against the design of the building. It looks very nice, but I feel that the scale is too large for this location. I would prefer to be... Um, three, four units maximum, um, but I feel that it's too big, and it's, um, in my opinion, and I'm very sorry to use this word, but it, it seems like, like it would be a McMansion on First Street. Um, our brand, okay, first of all, aesthetics, aesthetics matter, aesthetics do matter, and our brand coming at, driving into downtown Geneva on First Street is one of the main thoroughfares into our our downtown, our commercial district, and our um, is to see smaller homes, quaintness, yes, diversity, and and we can accommodate um, slightly higher um, housing density at this property. But five, the scale of this particular building is 
um, just too large uh, for the location. So um, I could go on, but I'll stop there. I'm against changing the zoning. Thank you. Anyone else on the dais? Anyone else from the audience on issues that have not yet been addressed? Ms. Mezzer? We got it. Okay. I just have a question speaking about the zoning. Um, th this isn't, because there are developments that are attached. This is in no way attached to the development, correct? Because then don't you usually pass it as an R7 PUD? This is zoning? This is strictly on the zoning. Okay, so I, I have a question here. Yes. And I'm not wishing anybody any ill will. But this gentleman, the developer, does not own this property, to my knowledge. The property is owned by somebody else. Uh, that's irrelevant. Well, actually, it isn't. Actually. It, it isn't to me, and I'm getting, well, I'm, with all due respect. Certainly. The reason it's not relevant, or the reason it is relevant to me, is if you grant the zoning, and let's say fin for financial reasons, or there was an argument between the developer and the, and the seller, you pass this R7, that is not, this development as we see it is not going to be guaranteed. And that concerns me too. Uh, so I guess that's just my question. This is totally separate. And once that goes, if something happens between the developer and the builder or financial hard times, whatever it is, it's R7. And you just, then you have to accommodate. If, I just want to make sure if somebody comes in, meets the requirements, doesn't ask for variances, it's a done deal, right? I mean, they can do R7 and put any of the permitted uses in it, to my understanding. I'm not talking about special uses. I'm talking about permitted with no variances. An at-right building Correct? permit. Okay, process. thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else? We have a motion on the floor. The motion was offered by, I believe, forgive me, Marks. Alderman Marks, and seconded by Alderman Bruno. Is that correct, Mr. Clerk? Correct. On the zoning matter, ladies and gentlemen, item 11A, Mr. Clerk, simple majority requires passage. That's six affirmative votes. Mr. Clerk, please take the roll. Mike Bruno. Aye. Sarah Burkhardt. Nay. Don Cummings. Nay. Becky Ruby. Aye. Dean Kilberg. Aye. Craig Malaja. Aye. Richard Marks. Aye. Dean McGowan. Nay. Jim Redecky. Aye. Robert Swanson. Aye. Mr. Clerk, I have uh, seven affirmative votes and three nay votes. Correct. The motion passes. Item 11B, ladies and gentlemen, is to consider ordinance number 2017-24, granting a preliminary and final planned unit development plan approval <coughs> for the First Street Row Homes as, pre as presented by CMM Holdings Limited Liability Corporation. So moved. Motion by Marks, <coughs> seconded by Mr. Cummings. This matter is on the floor. Uh, from the dais, any questions or comments? Clarifications required? Alderman Ruby? Once again, I'll ask, does anyone have any specific requests of the builder at this point that we could, you know, there's been talk about a win-win. I'm just, I'm curious if we can have a conversation about what that might entail from your perspective. Uh, well, hold on, uh, Daryl. Uh, uh, it, it's a it's a difficult situation to get in to have the conversation and, sure. and, and yeah. you know perhaps even readjust the PUD as presented. I think it's a fairer question to ask <coughs> as presented. If anyone has any questions regarding what's presented under the planned unit development for our consideration, now is the chance to speak and okay. Thank you. criticize Thank what you. have you. Respectfully, of course. Yeah. I'm Ken Utsi, 721 North 1st Street, and I'm the bozo that made that suggestion. <laughs> um, so we uh, sent out an email to Mr. Hogan, um, I think it was either on Wednesday or Thursday, and I believe Miles is the one that sent it. I got copied on it. And Mr. Mayor, I believe you were also copied on yes, it. Um, we didn't hear anything back from Mr. Hogan. Um, 
<clears throat> until today, and there was, I think you all know, a flurry of emails going on between myself and various other parties. But anyway, about 4.40 this afternoon, um, Mr. Hogan gave me a call at work. I wasn't able to talk with him at the moment, but I did call him back shortly after 5, and I'm happy to report that we had a really good conversation. Um, he expressed a willingness and an interest in trying to work out a win-win for not only himself, but also for the neighborhood. So, you know, I was, I was pleasantly surprised with that. But I think that this is not something that's going to happen overnight. I think it's a very real possibility. Shortly after I talked with Mr. Hogan, I talked with Miles, and he was delighted with the prospect of being able to work out some kind of a solution that satisfies not only the needs of the developer, but also the needs of the neighborhood, and kind of taking a look on a more broader basis to some of the, you know, some of the things that Mr. DeGroote has been talking about, you know, about building out that area in such a way that, you know, we've got room for uh, multifamily, but also multi-income. You know, not just having this be another McMansion for fat cats. You know, have a, because I mean, this is a, this is a very expensive proposition here. I mean, we're talking about essentially condos. They're gonna cost three quarters of a million dollars a piece. I mean, that's kind of outside the wheelhouse for most citizens of Geneva. If we're talking about meeting the housing needs of people in Geneva, I think that that's something that needs to be addressed. But anyway, you know, I think that we have an opportunity to sit down here with you know, Mr. DeGroote, with Mr. Hogan, with the neighbors, and work out a win-win situation if we give ourselves time to do it. And I'd like to point out that once you build a building, you can't unbuild it. So like whatever we put in now, you know, if it's unsatisfactory for whatever reason, we're stuck with it. So anyway, that's to address the questions about, you know, going for a win-win. I mean, I'm sure Mr. Hogan is very sincere. We are very sincere. And I'm sure that Mr. DeGroote is also very sincere with his vision of what the plan should be in the future. So let's work it out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Utzi. Uh, just for the record, ladies and gentlemen, um, th this, Mr. Utzi's comments regarding his conversation with Mr. Hogan present all of us with an interesting scenario. Uh, as the legislative body, we are required to vote on the matter before us, unless, of course, the petitioner chooses to ask for a continuance. If the petitioner chooses not to ask for a continuance, we cannot, we should not, Mr. City Attorney, correct me if I'm wrong, recommend some ad hoc win-win, for lack of a better word, scenario. Uh, I would also state that if, in fact, a dialogue was developed, Mr. DeGroote would not be present for that dialogue uh, at my direction. And just to clarify, Mr. DeGroote's vision for the city of Geneva is nothing but the re reaffirmation of this council's vision for Geneva as stipulated in the strategic plan. So I would kindly ask the petitioner yeah, before I answer the question, I just want to point out a few more uh, items regarding the concept of meetings and collaboration with the neighbors. You know, we, um, uh, we started this project about seven or eight months ago, uh, maybe longer, uh, in terms of our initial meetings with city staff. And we were advised there were two paths we could take. We could go right to application, go right to plan commission, or we could take baby steps through the process, stretch it out a little bit, and have a, cur I think it's called a courtesy review with the plan concept, review. concept review. So it was, you know, it was a small application fee, but we did have some pencil renderings. They weren't in AutoCAD yet. Uh, we did have an AutoCAD-based site plan, but didn't expend all the time and efforts on final engineering and floor plans. They weren't truly refined with things like colors and textures and materials. So uh, we did uh, take the cautious step because we wanted to make sure there was buy-in from the plan commission and the community. So um, we were advised uh, to notify the neighbors and I can testify here that uh, uh, the Hogan company did um, deliver, hand deliver and knock on 22 doors and doorbells. So um, we did canvas the neighborhood. We did 
personally deliver invitations to the uh, courtesy review hearing. And uh, perhaps Mr. Utsay didn't receive it because uh, last I checked, he's like 15 properties north of the site. So um, I don't think he's even within the legal range in terms of notification, but um, he's the only gentleman that really spoke about not having neighborhood collaboration, but I, of the 22 people we went to, we focused on the immediate area and the adjoining properties. So I, I wanna just make a final comment on a collaboration standpoint is we did, we did move cautiously and slowly uh, with the courtesy review and hearing no real negative comments at that courtesy hearing, uh, we did move ahead with the formal application process. So with that said, there's, the, uh, my client is the contract purchaser on the property and there are conditions on closing and timing in that. So I, I would plead for your vote tonight um, as opposed to any type of uh, continuance. Um, and at the appropriate time, Mr. Mayor, I can go into the details of the PUD. Based on that request, I think you should jump into the details mm -hmm. okay. of the PUD. And we should obviously, just a gentle reminder that you can certainly address questions that were raised by either council members and sure. or the audience. Okay. Yes, we'll do. Yes, Mr. Dick. I, I guess one more further comment mm -hmm. just before you get into it. I think it's, I think it's important to consider that there has been a process in place. There has been public notice. There has been public hearing. There has been public input. It's gone before various volunteer groups. It's gone before citizen groups. So, you know, to get to this point, I think that uh, the applicant absolutely is owed um, a vote on the matter as presented to us today. So, thank you. Uh, while we're on this plan, I want to point out some site plan features. Uh, each unit will have a, a front door with a sidewalk at grade. Uh, to the front of the property, taking advantage of the topography and the slope with the garages down at the basement level, uh, which of course all the units will have the capability of being served by an elevator. Uh, so there was some comments and talks about, oh, we need ranch level one level living. Well, with an elevator uh, in these units, um, it, it achieves a, a no stair type uh, living arrangement. Um, uh, there will be some um, features, ar architectural features on the front of the building that show some undulations. I'll get to that in a moment, but uh, the grades, the way they slope off to the back, we are integrating in um, some tree preservation features. There are a series of 20, 22, 24 inch diameter trees right along the lot line. Our increased setback of 22 some feet allows us to stay outside of any impact of the critical root zones of those trees. Uh, there is an intent to actually berm up the grades. These are one foot contour lines and will berm up the grades to kind of hide as much of the first level as possible. So again, staying consistent with the look that the front of the building is just two stories. We're gonna try and carry that as far along both sides of the building, almost all the way back to the chimney here, where you can see we're up at a higher grade. And at the same time, this is, this is right here is about a three foot terraced landscape retaining wall. Uh, I want to move around to the back of the site. We are proposing five off-street parking stalls along the back. Uh, they're parallel with the parking area to increase the green space setback along the back. Um, there is going to be um, a 24-foot drive aisle, and then there's going to be access to five separate two-car garages. You'll notice on the site plan that there are some undulations in the building that it's going to create some intrigue and create some shadows to the fact that it's going to break up uh, the massing of, um, of just one large rectangle. In fact, there's setbacks with, at each party wall. Will the building walls jog in and out? Um, uh, I'll note finally here in the back, we're proposing a uh, brick paver for the pavement area. You may recall the Park Place project has pavers. Those are actually permeable pavers, which is part of the stormwater management plan of the project. Our property is small enough and our net new impervious is small enough that we don't need stormwater filtration per se, but we are still offering as a PUD amendment uh, the look of the uh, perhaps the red brick pavers in the back area. Uh, it kind of fits in with the, um, with the timeless colonial architecture that you'll see in a moment with our building elevations. Um, the one last focal point in terms of exterior, we're proposing a proposed bench uh, on the corner here. There will be some um, some sidewalks or paver access points uh, for a, a, perhaps a community amenity. 
uh, that there's a bench at the back uh, for those walking the dogs or going down towards the river. Um, there's an opportunity for um, uh, the bench seating as well. I want to go to, um, oops, I'll go to that in a minute. This is the elevation of the building as viewed from the corner of Stevens and First. Um, again, I spoke of the colonial architecture that we have. Again, there's some, a lot of creative things have been done with the roof lines and the parapets, again, to create some intrigue, some shadowing where the building kicks in and out. Uh, there is a, 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 a sloped roof area here with a change in the window uh, to create some, some rhythms and undulations with even how the windows are rolling through the property. Um, I spoke of how the grade along the side is kept up high to the point where there are then two windows at the garage level in the back uh, with landscaping that will grow tall that will actually help mask and um, work with the uh, architecture of the building. I'll point out that I believe we have a, a, a nine or ten foot first floor and then I think a nine foot second floor um, that uh, and then just what's above that is a is a 36 inch parapet wall so that parapet wall as you can see in this diagram does actually do a good job of, 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 of masking or buffering that that glass greenhouse type enclosure and there's some synergies and some carryover from the greenhouse structures that were just across the street. Um, uh, and there's an opportunity there for uh, the potential buyer to, you know, perhaps there's a, a potting desk up there in that. Of course, there's a stairway and it's a way for the elevator to have access to the roof. This is the rear elevation. And um, you can see from this particular perspective, um, you know, the, the greenhouse elevator enclosures are still up there. I mean, you, you just kind of see a tip of it here. This is a true elevation. This was created in our AutoCAD 3D modeling software program. So this is at, you know, real life, um, six foot eye height standing on the sidewalk at the uh, southeast corner of the project. And of course, there's, um, uh, you know, focus point on larger expansive glass areas that actually like bring the eye to the main living space of this rear elevation. There's some architectural lighting features on each unit. And there was some intention with the contrast of the expansive glass with these French doors, if you would, that actually detract the eye from, from the garage doors that are undulating in and out. So we tried to go with the simplistic minimalistic look on the garage again that's all below grade uh, so that your your eye perhaps focuses on this area right here um, and then with with the, the colonial trends of the shutters on the windows and again you don't even see um, any of the rooftop activity that's been presented this is uh, the same autocad rendering but perhaps now from a bird's eye view and um, from a safety standpoint, uh, we are going to have a parapet height that's a minimum 36 inch tall. It's consistent with the building code for residential construction. I might add there's, there's hundreds or more situation in town with a, with a balcony or a living space above grade. Uh, the condo's just a block and a half south of us, of course. That's minimum three stories with a, a 36 inch type construction. I would add that this is solid masonry parapet type construction, so there's no rails or horizontal fence members that could make a fence easy to climb, so that is an added feature from a safety standpoint. I will note that there's a plan for like a wood wearing surface. It's gonna, first of all, you can see where the doors are situated. Um, the outdoor living space is gonna be limited to the rear uh, third of the property footprint as shown, kind of shown where the, where the furniture is located. And um, the parapet wall height is actually more than 36 inches off the roof height, roof height because this flooring system is perhaps four or five inches thick to support the, uh, the non-wearing surface and to create some elevation uh, from, the, from the tar paper roof. And so the parapet wall is high enough to meet the building code from a safety standpoint. Um, 
the uh, northerly most unit in, in this rendering wasn't updated, but we did agree to at the plan commission le uh, uh, level uh, to add in a fence, uh, a, uh, a 36 inch tall fence, uh, kind of where this last couch is shown. And the intention was to make this living space on the northerly most unit a little bit smaller uh, to keep people from getting close to the edge. Of course, there is a single family home to the north of us and out of respect for that, uh, we agreed as a condition that this northerly unit will have a fence, uh, wrought iron type block metal fence, that to actually hold any rooftop activity back five feet from that northerly edge of the building. And this is then another blow up feature. Um, there is uh, masonry parapets that separates uh, one rooftop section from the next. And of course, a, a railing here that keeps um, the, the usable area to the uh, improved finished surface of the south portion, or sorry, the east portion of the building. Um, um, there's a few other points to cover. Um, we, um, from a public utility standpoint, we have agreed to um, extend sanitary sewer, so there'll be extension of public utilities across the frontage of the property. Uh, we will, there actually is existing public water main, uh, but staff has said it's in, it's in pretty bad condition. It's, it's pretty old. Uh, so we actually have agreed to Im improve and replace the water main just across the frontage of our property. You recall the city expended capital improvements a few years ago to go all the way north along Wheeler Park. And, we're gonna complete a critical link adjacent to the frontage of our property. Um, um, I will point to you that, that this project kind of falls in line with the, the trend of development of the 2012 comprehensive plan. And um, it really meets the long-term <coughs> goals of the, the city and where the, where the planner actually had identified in the study that there's, there's, a, there's a need and a desire uh, with the aging of America and, and, and other generational trends to be close to a downtown area, an urban setting. And um, you know, the sales of Park Place, of course, support that. I, last I saw this evening, there's either four or five units left. Uh, so we saw some quick absorption rates, uh, which really just accentuates the 2012 comp plan is identifying this as a, a critical component to the to the livelihood of the city and satisfying a demand and a trend for this type of design. Um, the, um, um, the access for traffic is going to be limited to uh, Stevens Street. The, the brick paver uh, access driveway will take cars to Stevens, of which then there's two options to traverse around. Uh, there'll be no vehicular traffic to Illinois Route 31. Um, I, testified earlier about the sidewalk being set back about 12 or 13 feet out. Um, the, uh, the north side yard setback has some increased enhanced landscaping. Uh, there's an opportunity because of the, our, the change in zoning, the transition zoning in the PUB to not only keep the additional tree, the existing trees that are there, but also in that 22 feet supplement with some landscaping. You can see in this perspective, this is not the actual landscape plan, it is in your packet. Uh, but there is, with the extra green space, comes the opportunity for extra green uh, to be shown and supplemented with the, um, with the overstory trees. I'm going to flip back to this rendering here, and these trees are existing. Uh, I mentioned they are about 24 inches measured trunk diameter at waist height, but these trees are shown to scale. And if you just pause for a moment and look at the views from the windows in that, um, I mean, this, these were from photographs that we took on the west side of First Street. Um, you know, so we added that to the perspective of our CAD drawing, and the tops of those existing trees uh, do a pretty good job of not only shielding the two-story portion of the building, uh, but they actually measure about the same height as the chimney and the tips of the greenhouse elevator enclosures. Um, the, the last thing I'll mention here is that um, the majority of traffic will view and see this particular elevation. 
And um, I just want to accentuate how, um, you know, the, the fact that we went with a flat roof design and offered an opportunity for an amenity to take advantage of the river views to the east of us. Uh, it at the same time is a win-win because um, although there is a variance that we're asking for to this point up here, um, from the street view, from automobile traffic, we will actually see that our second floor, win floor windows do more or less line up with a traditional uh, two-story home uh, and this one is shown just next to us uh, with the 22 feet setback we're providing here uh, there's an additional 20 feet of setback from the lot line to the structure to the north again so the the height at this point is about 35 feet uh, but we are just over 40 feet in terms of green space separation to the structure uh, to the north so we did heed the advice and the suggestions of the plan commission and um, we went through a couple of meetings. Uh, there are a couple of two-hour meetings plus, and we were happy that, to get a 7-1 vote from Plan Commission uh, based on all these uh, plan recommendations and adjustments before you. So at that point, I'll be available for any questions. Thank you. Questions or comments? Alderman Ruby. Um, can you please go over the regulations for the rooftop? I know last week we discussed that, and there was some concern about lack of, but. If, mm -hmm. Oh sure. If, it's been noted that they do exist, but we just didn't go over them in detail. Can you just reiterate where we can find them or what, what the mm -hmm. titles oh, of the documents um, are? If it's the flavor of the council to uh, to go along with the vote, um, there could be considerations for um, um, making the parapet wall higher. Uh, that's something we oh, talked sure. about. Um, there would be a deviation from the Illinois Building Code uh, and all the other projects that have already been approved mm -hmm. uh, in the city of Geneva. Um, any of the condos uh, uh, just down the road from here or any of the recent projects, even on 7th Street across from Joseph's, um, um, they have decks with railings. Uh, they're all slats and they are at 36 inch height. So it's, if it's the flavor of the council, uh, we could consider that. Uh, as part of the recommendation, um, I advise that um, you know we'll we'll leave it up to you on that regard. Um, separately, uh, we talked about um, one thing we could do is talk about restricting rooftop um, grilling to gas grills. Um, anything grass, we would be willing to agree. And there will be HOA covenants for this project, so uh, we're offering it that if it's the flavor of the council as part of the recommendation that we could restrict charcoal uh, and limit gas grilling um, on the rooftop areas. Uh, that's common in some uh, condo HOA covenants. So, okay, so is, are there rules existing already defined that we would just adopt or? I, I believe Alderman Ruby's asking uh, about the International Building Code that we yes. adopt regularly from the council. Mm -hmm. There's also a commercial building code that is separate, but David, I think, is best to address the IBC. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> I, I think you covered it. We have adopted the internet, um, the International Residential Code and the International Building Code. Okay. Uh, this project falls under the Residential Code, which requires that minimum railing height of 36 inches. We also, of course, have the Fire Code, which has fire separation, sprinkler requirements, uh, what have you, uh, to, to address any of those concerns. Okay. It and does not prohibit what type of grill would be permitted. Okay, and then as far as like patio furniture, for example, is, is there any concern about that with some of these windstorms we've had this year? Um, we don't have any regulations on okay. that, and, and if we even tied those onto the PUD, I don't know how we would go about enforcing those Okay. Uh, with inspections or, or whatever. Um, but I think it, similar situations across the street at Park Place, if you're putting sure. patio furniture on, the, on that second floor or third floor balcony, you're going you're gonna to make sure it's secured or it's heavy enough to, to sustain most winds. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Alderman Marks. Um, I am I'm probably one of the people who I think there's a lot of difference between a balcony and a living space as a rooftop. I personally would prefer the walls to go up to the 42 inches just because a balcony is not that big. If kids are on there, someone's really close. 25 feet is a long space, and 
I know one of my kids was a climber and it wouldn't take him long to get over that. I would like to see us, and I guess we would have to put it in the PUD to make it 42 inches. I don't know if we make an amendment to the motion or if we vote on that separately, Mayor. I guess I would leave that up to you. I'd recommend we vote on it separately. Fine. And if it passes, then we include it. In so the do I make a motion now for that? or You can. I'll make a motion that the parapet walls have to go up to 42 inches rather than the 36. And I guess I need a second for that. Second by Alderman McGowan. Daryl? Of course we are. Yeah, Absolutely. Go. Well, now that you asked for it, <laughs> <laughs> we're going we're gonna to rifle through the council first. Anyone else from the dais? Now, this is to the amendment. Yeah, this is to the amendment. That is correct. Yeah, I can. Sorry. Sure. Then Alderman Kilbert? Uh, well, we're. Uh, putting that list together, I would, uh, and it sounds as though uh, the Homeowners Association probably would go with gas, gr gas grills as well. Uh, well, I think that, is that really a germane? That's a that's well, an HOA decision. I, I mean, I understand what you want to do, but I don't know that we can effectively do that. I think if with a with a roof construction of that nature, I think our fire department might have a voice in that as well. As I under, well, <clears throat> I would agree with Alderman Radecki. I think we're down a slippery slope. <laughs> okay. Um, but, and, and the fire department has chimed in with respect to this project. They signed off on all the construction materials, et cetera, as it meets the uh, International Fire Code. Uh, our fire department is accredited agency. Other agencies look to it for leadership. They provided that leadership. Yeah. So. I'll withdraw that consideration then. Alderman Cummings, then Bruno. Um, as I mentioned last week, we've got a place in the city. The balcony is, uh, we're on the 19th floor. Um, it's corner unit. The balcony gets windy, gets really windy in Chicago. We have light furniture. It, it shifts around a little bit. It does not go over the railing. The railing is 42 inches. Um, a 42 inch railing is, uh, is a little bit obnoxious when you're sitting. Uh, to see something that height, um, it's a shame. But I sit there and I, I've this, just this week and weekend and last week thought about this, and I thought, you know, given given the two 36 inches and kids climbing over 42, aesthetically less pleasing, I, I'll take the 42. Um, it makes the building a little bit taller. Keep that in mind. Um, we also have a gas grill only, not charcoal grill rule. Uh, however, that could be put into the paperwork. I think that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, generally, I really like this project. I love the outdoor living space. I, I live for being outside. And, and this um, Geneva is beautiful to look at. I, I think that um, I, I'm very pleased with this project. Uh, thank you. On the amendment, anyone else from the council? Alderman Bruno. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, just to reiter reiterate some of what Alderman Cummings said, the uh, um, uh, the safety 42 inches is is real. Uh, a parapet wall versus a railing, which is much easier to climb, is a consideration. And uh, one thing that I, I I'm looking to minimize the impact of this building should it pass um, for the neighbors so i would tend to go with the shorter code railing just to minimize the mass thank you from the audience mr Molnar, good evening good evening um few concerns with this project. Um, aesthetically, sure, great. Um, it does fall short of the transitional setback. We've already talked about that. There's zero regulations on what the homeowner can do when they get that building. Once it's sold, if I spent 700000 and excuse me, that's, I believe, the starting point for this house. Um, you know, it's like buying a car. The moment you want automatic transmission, leather interior, it goes up, up, up. So I understand why you guys uh, decided to move to R7. You know, Geneva has an aging population you want to accommodate. I don't see how this plan does. 
uh, in regards to the zero regulations on rooftop decks, what's to stop them when, you know, I guess an HOA, but from having a charcoal grill, from having an outdoor sauna, from having a hot tub? I mean, at this price point, you know, the sky is the limit of what these homeowners can put up there. And there truly is a nuisance factor for having parties or whatnot at that height of an elevation right next door to single family homes. Um, my two cents, I don't, Alderman Bruno, you switched your vote on the fact of protecting a 25 foot setback. This does not right there. Um, thank you for your consideration, I guess. Thank you, sir. Ms. Woods? Hello. Good evening. I'm Daryl Woods. Uh, I live at 721 North 1st Street. And um, I've <coughs> participated in all of the public hearings except for the one for the uh, conceptual design. So um, I've been involved um, in providing feedback. Um, I've testified in detail before the Committee of the Whole about my concerns with regard to public safety and the neighborhood nuisance impact of the rooftop decks. Um, I'm not going to repeat that testimony. Rather, I want to discuss and submit for the record, um, and I don't know if anything can be submitted for the record, but okay, um, some of the documents and information that I gathered in the course of preparing for the public hearings. Um, Miles has talked about regulations, so um, I guess it's, it's a fact that um, this development um, appears to be, um, well, I'm saying it's a fact, but I'm contradicting myself. This development um, appears to be the first rooftop decks that have been proposed for a residential community in Geneva, to my knowledge. Um, while permits are required for all decks, I don't believe our city has any regulations or code pertaining to rooftop, rooftop decks or rooftop decks with greenhouse structures, especially in a residential setting. And the discussion has sort of confirmed that. Um, we're in uncharted territory, something I've said before. And uh, I've also stated that rooftop decks present unique challenges. Um, the building code and the municipal code of the city of Chicago defines a deck as an open, unroofed structure designed or used for more than incidental occupancy. Whereas the code defines a rooftop deck as a deck that is erected on top of the roof or on top of any part of a building. And the code specifies some requirements for those um, decks. Per my observation, besides being on top of a building, a rooftop deck is completely open to the elements on all sides, the sun, the wind, the rain, etc. As an avid walker, as well as a person who drives every day on First Street past the subject property, one of my concerns is whether a pedestrian like myself or an automobile might be struck by an object swept from the roof by wind or a combination of wind and rain. Um, absent specific regulations or code, the city has no way to control what homeowners put on rooftop decks. What they construct on rooftop decks, in other words, if someone decides that they want to um, erect a privacy screen between their deck and their neighbors, the city has no way to control that. Um, nor um, can the city control what type of activities or uses that take place on the deck. Um, so if someone wants to have a working greenhouse on that deck or put a roof garden, um, there's no way to regulate that. Absent regulations, what information would be available to guide current and future homeowners or homeowner associations on safety issues, both for persons using the decks and for persons who live in adjacent properties? Two other points about safety. Um, the developer's representatives have emphasized that these decks are located on the back sides of the roof, with the implication that the potential dangers to persons on the ground are minimized. 
It's all a matter of perspective. These decks are only on the back side of these buildings to a person standing on First Street. For the property owners to the east and the north, one or more of these decks are at, on the side closest to them. Either way, the location alone doesn't sufficiently mitigate the impact of the winds and rains we have been experiencing in this area, especially on objects placed on the roof, whether it's, a whether it's furniture, a trellis, or a privacy screen. Um, there's been some discussion about um, the minimum design standards for decks. Um, when it comes to, and I think it sounds like um, there's some agreement that um, the minimum is not enough. It's, it's a baseline, particularly when it comes to the safety of children and adults. Um, I would hope that we could do better than baseline. Um, given that the subject property is on a high vehicular traffic street um, with attendant public safety risk, I question the wisdom of even locating this particular type of project on First Street. Okay, with respect to the documents, um, I spent some try time trying to research, um, my throat is dry, best practices um, regarding safety and design as well as the regulation of rooftop decks. I discovered, as some of you may know, uh, a number of municipalities have some form of specific regulations or codes. These include, but are not limited to Chicago, San Francisco, Boston, Seattle, New York City, and smaller cities like Arroyo Grande, California, which has a population of 17,000 people, and Harbor Point, Michigan, which has a population of about 1,100 people. They have code related to rooftop decks. Um, all of these municipalities have code that's available online, so I'm not including them here as examples, but there's other information I did want to attach. Um, the San Francisco, I'm calling it Exhibit A. I don't have anything to show you. It's just in the packet that I have. Um, the San Francisco Planning Department um, has put together uh, a document. It's called Decks on Roofs uh, Residential, and it's, it's, um, it's available on the web. Uh, it provides information to residents um, who are interested in either adding to or replacing a roof deck. It appears to be very user friendly. It describes the permit process, how to find out if a project would be permit, would be permitted, would be permitted in a particular zoning district and whether there would be a neighborhood notification requirement. Um, my second exhibit um, is an article that appeared in Cranes in 2015, and um, that's Crane Chicago Business, and it's on the growing trend of building rooftop decks on garages. What was happening, what's been happening in Chicago, um, the real estate market in Old Town, Lincoln Park, Lakeview is very hot, and residents, um, were interested in having more green space, and so they started building rooftop decks on garages. Um, and there had been some complaints from no local residents that these decks and patios were destroying the feel of their neighborhoods. So the city of Chicago implemented some zoning changes, which made the process of securing permits both timely and costly because um, a zoning lawyer might have to be hired or um, drawing submitted. As a result of the dem demand, the city passed an ordinance in April 2017 clarifying, clarifying building and zoning requirements for rooftop decks and garages. Uh, the amendments are expected to streamline the permit process, and the ordinance also clarifies several existing and fire uh, resistive requirements related to rooftop decks. Um, the point I'm making here is that there was um, a situation in Chicago where people were on an ad hoc basis just putting um, decks on garages um, without any uh, concern for what the code, um, the regulations were. And rather than just issue a permit, what the city did was um, 
amend the code so that the process, the permitting process could be expedited much more efficiently and, um, and also um, make it easier for people to really understand um, the regulations. Uh, my third exhibit um, is um, a 2015 information sheet on code requirements for rooftop decks. And it was prepared by the River North Residents Association. River North is the area that's north of the Chicago River and west of Michigan Avenue. And um, this particular document, again, um, it, the Neighborhood Association prepared it to advise property owners and condominium boards on code requirements for fire resistant rated construction and to warn against non-conforming uses. Uh, it also advises that properties may be inspected and provides access links to municipal code as well as contact information. My point here is that the Homeowners Association couldn't provide this information without the city adopting regulations with respect to um, uh, a specific type of rooftop um, use. Uh, my fourth exhibit is um, two memorandums um, that were um, put together this year by the Arroyo Grand um, California Planning Commission. Uh, the memorandums are dated February 21st, 2017 and August 1st, 2017. Arroyo Grand has a population of roughly 17,000 people. Uh, the city is currently in the process of considering an ordinance to amend its municipal code regarding rooftop decks. Um, the city currently doesn't have any regulations. Um, the two memos provide background. In brief, Due to recent inquiries and questions regarding projects involving rooftop decks, the staff recommended that the Planning Commission consider amending the municipal code. After a public hearing process, and I think that's important, there was a public hearing process, the Commission did approve a resolution at its August 1st, 2017 meeting. The matter will be considered by the City Council and a final vote is expected at the October 24th meeting. The ordinance recommended by the Planning Commission finds that unless properly regulated, rooftop decks can result in adverse impacts on adjacent properties, and that the purpose of the regulations is to ensure that the new rooftop decks conform to the scale and character of the neighborhood in which they are located. Uh, the proposed amendments also address a technical um, definitional question that the staff, the planning staff had about rooftop decks. Um, I only have two other exhibits, so I'll wrap up. Um, my, I'm calling it Exhibit E. Um, there was a um, CBS News um, did a report. Um, I'll just give you the title. It says, DOB suggests falling hammock, hammock, hammock accident was preventable. On April 26th of this year, a female pedestrian was struck and seriously injured by a hammock that flew off a five-story Tribeca roof. The winds were reportedly less than 30 miles per hour. I'm including this article because it contains a statement from a New York City Building Department official who weighed in saying that the, this accident was entirely preventable if the furniture on the deck had been properly secured. He said that when an owner isn't home and a wind event occurs, the public is endangered. And if the owner is home, then the owner too is endangered. So again, um, this points to the need for having some type of regulations that um, owners can use and also condo associations or homeowners associations can use um, to develop guidelines um, and also understand what their liabilities and risks are. My mouth is really dry. So I got one more thing I have. I think I can get one more sentence out. Um, <laughs> my final exhibit is um, an informational article. Uh, it's called How to Design Roof Decks for Kids. And it was prepared by the San Francisco Chronicle. And it's just an informational article on things that can be done to make roofs um, safe for children. Um, so that's the extent of. Um, 
what I have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank, you. thank you. And um, I can just, uh, who would I give this Present to? Send this to the clerk. Okay. The clerk will ensure that it is. And captured. I apologize, my throat just got. Thank you. Anyone else? This is on the PUD. Seeing none, from the Alderman Kilberg? Yeah. The amendment. It's on the amendment. Just the amendment. On the amendment, excuse me. Sorry. I don't On the amendment. Okay, sorry. On the amendment, Alderman Ruby? Um, I just wanted to comment on the parapet wall height. Am I on the right topic? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I would just default to the expertise of staff on this one. I don't feel like I have enough knowledge about this personally, and I haven't done any research on it. Um, I guess, David, would you like to comment? On, on what the recommended parapet wall height would be? We're, we're comfortable with the 36 inches that's required by the IRC. Okay, do, I guess, do you have a, a, a quick list of like pros and cons for both or do you do not even i mean it's i have i have kids of my own mm -hmm. um you just to, feel a 36 is adequate i feel like they could climb either one if they sure. really wanted to <laughs> yes, right. yeah um to be honest i mean <clears throat> okay on the amendment anyone else on the amendment, Mr. Clerk, kindly take the roll. Are you are we clear what the amendment is? Point of order, yeah, that's yeah. the point uh, of order. An affirmative vote would be for the increased. It would require parapet. that the developer build the parapet wall to 42 inches as opposed to the current 36 inches as recommended. So an affirmative vote would mean that it would require the developer to do so. A nay vote would mean that the 36 is sufficient. A simple majority carries the day. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Clerk. Mike Bruno. Nay. Sarah Burkhardt. Aye. Don Cummings. Aye. Becky Ruby. Nay. Dean Kilberg. Nay. Craig Malaja. Aye. Richard Marks. Aye. Dean McGowan. Aye. Jim Redecky. Nay. Robert Swanson. Nay. The motion is tied five to five. I will vote nay. Back to the main motion as presented. Any comments, questions regarding item 11B on the entire plan unit development? Alderman Kilbert? Yeah. I've had it. Uh, uh, one nice thing about the Committee of the Whole is, uh, uh, is it gives you an opportunity to uh, go home after you hear uh, input from the, uh, the t as in this case, from the residents, as well gives the um, gives uh, uh, people in the community an opportunity to provide input. It also gives you an opportunity to go home and deliberate, think about it, and also to uh, do some of your own research as it relates to some of the things that are shared uh, by our, both our staff as well as residents that bring forward points that you may not have had an opportunity to consider at the committee of the whole meeting. Um, so I developed a checklist last week, and there were things that I wanted to try to address uh, in my thought process as it relates to this topic. And uh, uh, i just share a few of the things that uh, uh, came to mind and, and things that I pondered and uh, uh, used in uh, arriving at my decision. And uh, last week I was uh, a no vote, and uh, the intent was is that uh, I needed more time wasn't prepared to support uh, at that point in time uh, what was before us. Uh, you know, uh, there are uh, probably a half a dozen things or more as it relates to this uh, this development. I think that uh, that uh, uh, have merit. Uh, obviously, there are some things that were concerned to me last week. Uh, if you recall, a couple of years ago, I was against Park Place. And I was one of the lone voices on uh, on the council at that time that was opposed to R7 as well as the development of Park Place. And uh, as I look around the audience this evening, I don't see a lot of the people that were opposed uh, to Park Place at that time here, 
that were in attendance uh, two years ago. Um, and uh, Park Place was approved. Park Place has been developed, uh, 36 units, 31 of, of which are sold. Uh, so we're talking about 80% of that development is sold. Um, comments this evening were that, well, is this going to be affordable? Well, you know, in America, uh, people invest money in things that they think will return them a profit. And uh, uh, in regard to this, uh, I think there's proof across the street from the proposed development that shows that this type of product does have merit and will sell in Geneva. We may not like that product specifically, uh, but the reality of the situation is, is there are people with money and they're prepared to purchase that type of property. Uh, you know, uh, are they fat cats? Well, they're wealthy. Will I ever live in one of those properties? Probably not. But the thing is, is that there are people that want to come to Geneva and purpose, purchase that type of a property. Uh, as you look at, uh, at this, uh, I think there are similar types of constructions that have been accepted in, and uh, are compatible with uh, residential neighborhoods in the community. Uh, I haven't heard anything negative about uh, 7th Street and what's happened there. Uh, uh, we had concerns voiced by residents as it relates to the 4th Street project. And again, there may be objections and other uh, negatives that come forward as a result of that, but I haven't heard anything yet uh, in regard to that. Uh, and again, are they identical types of constructions? No. But I think that uh, it does show that that these types of uh, constructions can transition into uh, effectively within uh, residential neighborhoods. Uh, you know, I think the, the project has uh, financial strength, uh, and uh, uh, I think that uh, the quality of the work of the developer, which I've continued to check out, I think is is uh, is very good, and I think will be a, could uh, could bring a nice addition to the community as far as architecture and design. Um, uh, I think the uh, one of the voices I have not heard or seen here at this meeting are the residents across the street uh, that are, are purchasing properties in Park Place. Okay, uh, those people have an investment, and they've made an investment recently in their properties, and I haven't heard any resident of Park Place come here to the council and express concerns about this type of construction across the street from them. And those are the people that are going to be looking directly out of their their windows across the street at this uh, this this project, um, and they have made a significant investment in their properties as well. So you might say, well, they're living in the same same type of of, of property that that uh, uh, the residents across the street are going to be living in. So why would they be opposed to it? Well, the reality is, we approve Park Place, and this has certainly a compatibility with it. So the question is, is what type of a transitional uh, property are we going to have between what we have along River Lane uh, and uh, what we have with Park Place as you enter Geneva from the north? Uh, again, you can argue about this, but as Alderman Cummings mentioned, be careful what you ask for because I think with R7 and what we're looking at here, it might be much better than what potentially could have happened if, in fact, R6 was approved this evening. Um, you know, I think that uh, if we look at how the property along River Lane to the north, the, the bottling plant, how that whole area will eventually be developed, I think there is going to be a, a lot of compatibility with what's being proposed here. And I think that this will serve, in a sense, as a transitional parcel, as a transitional portion of that block that will help flow into the residential that we have north on 31. Um, you know, I, I, um, it, this is an opportunity for the city to uh, have a developer improve uh, infrastructure, uh, provide utilities that are desperately needed in, in certain older parts of the community. They're paying for it rather than the taxpayers. Uh, that's a plus. And, uh, you know, um, as far as uh, safety considerations, if you, I think if you follow this council over the last uh, five years, probably... Uh, this seat on the council has expressed concerns relating to safety as much as anyone and challenging the city in regard to safety. I'm very safety conscious. 
But the thing is, is the city council can't legislate against uh, alcohol and the impact of alcohol as it relates to falling off a roof. It can't, uh, uh, it can't uh, uh, prevent poor parenting. And if your children fall off a roof, who's responsible? Is it the child or the parent? And acts of God, there are certain things as it relates to acts of God that we can try to prevent. But ultimately, at the end of the day, if an act of God has an impact as it relates to furniture blowing off roofs, etc., uh, uh, we can't prevent all of it. So um, with that, taking all that into consideration, uh, 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 I'm going to, uh, to vote yes on this development because I think uh, in the long run, I think it's going to be a plus, and especially with what's happened across the street at Park Place, I think there's certainly a compatibility and, and, uh, and uh, 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 an opportunity for the, uh, the community to continue to move forward. And uh, uh, I don't think that this type of property is going to generate a lot of students. I think looking at Park Place and the number of students that it's generated, those 31 units, uh, I don't think that it's going to, to, uh, to impact a number of students. So, uh, and I, I, the research that I've done, the residents that have purchased properties in Park Place are somewhere, uh, the average age is somewhere in, in, really in the low 50s rather than 65 or 70 or 35 or 40. And I think those, those people, uh, their, their families are raised, they're coming to Geneva to, uh, to enjoy our community and, uh, and uh, with this type of property and if they're prepared to make that type of investment, I'm prepared to welcome them. That's it. Thank you, sir. Alderman Rudecki. Yeah, just one quick comment. Uh, Mr. Utzi brought it up, Mr. Mueller brought it up, and uh, Alderman Kilberg touched on the issue of affordability. And you know, it's a good question. And regardless of however the vote goes with this particular item, um, it's, a, it's a bigger issue for our council to consider outside of the realm of this applicant's application. That question should not turn, nor should he be held accountable for any way, shape, or form for affordability at this point at the game. That's, that wasn't his responsibility. You know, he's going by what's market-driven, and that's what we've allowed to happen. If we want to have the political will or courage, whatever you want to call it, to uh, move towards affordable housing, that's a bigger issue. It's a bigger discussion. It's something that should happen outside of uh, the discussion you know, around one particular application. So, you know, we talk a lot about this, and we talk a lot about this, and we talk a lot about this, but we don't seem to do anything about it. So regardless of the outcome of the vote, um, maybe that's a takeaway, whether it's positive or negative on this application, um, something that we probably need to uh, discuss in another environment, in another setting. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Alderman Bruno. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, to Mr. Radecki's point, um, absolutely uh, empathize with that uh, uh, discussion on, uh, on affordability. Uh, that is something that I've been focusing on more and more. Uh, our aging population needing place to live. Um, uh, but the, the reality with the PUD, I, I, as I approach it, is um, if I, we can, we can base our vote on anything subjective. We can, it's not, uh, getting a PUD is not a right, it's something they have to earn. Um, I, I have no doubts that uh, Mr. Hogan will build a, uh, a fine product, but in our first meetings I, I expressed my, uh, my concerns with the size. These are substantially larger than the largest unit uh, at Park Place. Um, honestly, I'd rather have, instead of five 3,200 square foot units, I'd rather have 10, 1,600 foot units to appeal to downsizing seniors and uh, millennials. Um, we don't have too many parcels to work with. Uh, if we had lots of uh, infill space, you know, throw it out there like feed corn, that's, uh, I'd probably give it some slack, but we really have very few opportunities to address in town, uh, modestly size. If, uh, I, I always avoid affordable, because affordable in Geneva is not the uh, easiest bogey to, uh, to hit. Um, uh, again, I have n every confidence that Mr. Hogan is going to build a, a fine product should this pass. Um, uh, 
there are a lot of interesting things about this. I think there's a lot of really clever things about this. But as I said uh, last week, uh, um, it doesn't ring many of my bells. Um, thank you. Alderman Cummings, do you have your hand up? Um, I, I too recognize the need that we have in the city for all sorts of housing. We, we paid a lot of money for a housing study, long-term housing study, and we see where our shortages are. We see that we're light in certain areas and heavy in others. Uh, but the last thing I would ever want to do is on an unearmarked piece of property, wait until the nth hour, say, you know, this looks nice, but gosh, you know, why don't you put 400 one-bedroom apartments up in there and, and uh, uh, make it affordable. That's got to be earmarked way ahead of time, and then uh, somebody comes in and takes a look at that idea. As far as the height from the street, from one side, this looks uh, um, very acceptable. From the other, it's tall. That's what happens in a hilly area. Uh, you know, the alternative is to step it down as you go down the hill. Well, that, you know, then it looks like a snail or something I mean it, it's odd so so it's too bad that it's um, big in the back but that's that's what happens uh, uh, I am excited about this I, I oh and, and I have a story um, this is from a local insurance agent no you can't get out without a story right so uh, we had uh, when our kids were home we had a, a trampoline in our yard and my insurance agent said to me be sure you stake that thing down now there's, at the time there was no uh, ordinance in Geneva that I had to tie a, tie a trampoline to the ground. Um, uh, but I did. Insurance agent even told you to get rid of the darn thing probably. <laughs> well, or buy more insurance. Um, I, I used to sail and I understand the whole uh, sail area to, to weight ratio. And uh, this guy said, well, the wind came along and picked up someone's trampoline and blew it right through the living room bay window. And the, and the people were gone and the storm came into the house for 48 hours straight or something, ruined the house. So I tied the trampoline down. I'm really reluctant to, um, I would be very reluctant to start putting in ordinances to do things like lock your bike, tie your trampoline down, make sure your parking brakes on. I, at some point, like uh, Alderman Kilberg said, we, we can't legislate um, idiocy, right? Uh, maybe he didn't use that word. Um, anyway, again, I'm in favor of, I'm in favor of this. Thank you. Alderman McGowan. Thank you. I have a question for Mr. Green. Is it? Mr. Green, please. Um, we had a recent um, home built in Geneva by the high school. It was new construction, single family home, and um, the elevation of the, I guess, I don't know, the base of the home was based on the highest point of the lot. It, it turned out this home ended up appearing like several feet higher than all of the neighboring homes. So I did hear you mention in your presentation that the sidewalks coming from the front doors would be at street level. Um, can you assure us that this building would not be like, um, would be higher than the, the home next door? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, the process we've been through with the city. I mean, excuse me, just to clarify, just ba you, that you're not going to increase the I guess the ground, so oh, that it would, it would the elevation. Thank you. So that it would, it would then end up being, despite this drawing showing that they line up perfectly, that it wouldn't end up being higher. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, my best response to that is staff has already reviewed and approved our final engineering drawing. So um, I didn't go through in detail the technical aspects of the grading plan, but I have already assigned some top of foundation elevations, and. Um, Oh, yeah, sure enough, right here. So the, um, um, so the, I'll, just to pick on one specific street, the center line of First Street right here, this is the north unit, 705.86. That's the crown of the asphalt. That's where the yellow skip dash is. 
and then um, the public sidewalk that's existing is at elevation 704.4 so that's down about 16 inches from the street actually below the curb okay and so then the the finished grade at the corner of the building uh, uh, the gra the landscape is all the 705.1 elevation so um, so we're committed to this engineering here uh, the 7065 elevation is just um, about eight inches above the center of the road that's the porch you, know, you come you come out of your unit you one step down and then you can see there's two more steps down to the 705 elevation so I can testify that we are committed to adhering to this plan. It's already been reviewed and vetted by city staff. Can you please go back to the previous picture mm -hmm. showing the single family home that's there now and then the proposed row homes? So would is this how the building would look once it's built as far as the elevation mm -hmm. would those windows be exactly lined up with the windows of the single family home because I know you said you're committed but that's not I'm not really sure what you mean by that well this is the our, Dan Marshall is the architect of St. Charles second generation local architect and he couldn't be here tonight because he's traveling uh, but um, so th this is his work product here and um, uh, he had shared with me that he prepared this off of his AutoCAD renderings and it was merged with photographic data uh, to prepare this, uh, this artist rendering. And the, the grades that are shown here are consistent with the grades that I showed on the engineering plan. So um, I can testify that, yeah, it, it's our intent that this would be as close as practical and humanly possible to what's going to be constructed understanding that this rendering is created with a pencil um, at the same time it was created with a pencil because we had to uh, morph in the adjacent residence off of photographs and it was on short order this was prepared about uh, about a day and a half's notice before the second plan commission meeting but um, yeah I believe my testimony is true and factual to what's going to be to be constructed are the basements of the proposed row homes going to be like nine foot, like the deep pour type basements? Uh, yeah, about nine feet. And yes. what happens, it's very close to the river, what happens if, you know, they start excavating or whatever and find out, oh gosh, we really can't, you know, there's water there, there's something there that is going to prevent us now from, you know, we digging down that deep and we're going to have to bump it up. Yeah, we won't be allowed to because the ordinance that's before you tonight is going to commit and limit us to a certain height. So if we had to bump it right. up, we'd have to go back to the drawing board. Okay. So we, we won't be allowed to uh, bump it up. We did complete soil borings. I did complete topography. We are on the FEMA datum. Uh, our garage floors are more than 10 feet above the floodplain, so I don't expect water to be a problem. We did already drill the land. Uh, mm -hmm. to confirm and so we know what's underground okay thank you sure. anyone else in the dais alderman marks yeah, you know last week i like alderman kilberg voted no um, for the plan unit development um, part of that was is i did need more time to go back and look at things um, and i didn't want the developer to feel that you know they had the votes in their pocket already that that it was going to go through you know, I've done a lot of research also this week on, on ordinances regarding rooftops. Um, you know, I did speak to David once. I, I spoke to the, the, the engineer once. Um, I like this design. I like this layout for this, this area. I think it is a good transition. I don't know what's going to happen with the bottling works, but I, I think this fits in. According to the comprehensive plan, I do believe that this size building is what was contemplated when the comprehensive plan was done. So. I will be voting yes for the plan unit development. Any last minute questions or comments? Clarifications? On ordinance number 2017-24, we have a motion and a second. Simple majority is required. Mr. Clerk, when you're available, please take the roll call. Mike Bruno. <coughs> Nay. Sarah Burkhardt. Nay. Aaron Cummings. Aye. Nikki Ruby. Aye. Dean Kilberg. Aye. Craig 
Ladra? Aye. Richard Marks? Aye. Dean McGowan? Nay. Jim Radecki? Aye. Robert Swanson? Aye. Mr. Clerk, I believe that's seven affirmative votes and three nay votes? Correct. The motion is passed, ladies and gentlemen. According to my scorecard, we are at item 13, new business. or any new business from anyone from the audience? From the dais? Alderman McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, um, I appreciated you giving the moment of silence um, at the beginning of tonight's meeting. Um, and I know there's two ongoing needs right now in the United States, and that, that would be to kind of contribute to hurricane relief efforts. Um, and so Houston, Florida, Puerto Rico, and all the other Caribbean islands affected. And also, um, I know a big need now is to donate blood. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Radicki. Um, yeah, I'd like to uh, congratulate the mayor on the birth of his first grandson this week. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. How do you feel? None of your business. <laughs> <laughs> Alderman Kilberg. Uh, this week, and again, uh, not specifically on the issue of the on other issues as it relates to staff. I, uh, it's disheartening sometimes when citizens resort to just uh, uh, impugning our staff as, as uh, taking on some type of a bias or an agenda. And uh, at this point in the evening, I just want to thank our staff for their diligence and hard work on a number of different projects. And I'm controversial and, and uh, microphone. I'm sorry. sorry, it's a little late now, but. But anyhow, I want to thank, that's our police department, public works, uh, all departments uh, for uh, uh, sometimes standing in the line of fire and, uh, and taking on difficult issues and trying to, to bring forward good information for the, the council uh, to deliberate on and, and hopefully make good decisions. Well said. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we're at the bewitching hour of Recommending a motion to adjourn. So moved. Alderman Marks makes the motion. Okay. Alderman Ruby makes the second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Microphones are off. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Mm -hmm.